Hello, everyone, and welcome back to One Civil Law, where, as always, we learn through the misfortunes of others. I am your host, Uncivil Law, a licensed attorney in Texas, Virginia, and before the U.S. Supreme Court, and I hope you're having a great day. For today's case, we turn our attention to oral arguments at the Supreme Court as it relates to a regulation from the ATF concerning what are called bump stocks. So, a little bit of background before we start. If you're talking about a rifle, a rifle is composed of three major components, the lock, the stock, and the barrel. The lock is the portion that the, the bullet cycles through. It is where the bullet is actually shot from and ejected from. The barrel is obviously the part that the bullet comes out of. And the stock is sometimes referred to as the furniture, namely the parts of the gun that put together, that hold the stock or otherwise called the frame of the gun, hold the frame of the gun so that it is more easy to use and hold. And a rifle stock will typically have a flat portion at the back so that you can push it up against your shoulder. Now the stock might be adjustable, it might not be adjustable, right? So you have a stock that's just a, a piece of wood, so a completely unadjustable stock. You have stocks that telescope, that go in and out. You have tox stocks that can fold to make the firearm more compact. And you have other forms of stock depending on what you need and other use cases. So a stock is just a typical part of the gun. It is the furniture. It is the non-functional component of the gun the, that holds the frame of the gun to hold the mechanism of the gun. All right, great. So what is a bump stock? Well, it, we have to also talk about what a semi-automatic firearm is, which the vast, 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 vast majority of firearms are. Automatic firearms are tightly regulated. You've probably never used one. They're very hard to come by and you have to pay a special tax stamp and everything. An automatic firearm will, will keep firing as long as you hold down the trigger. So you hold down the trigger and it will just keep shooting round after round after round as long as you hold it down. A semi-automatic doesn't do that. It just fires one round for each pull of the trigger. So you have to pull the trigger every single time. So what a bump stock does is it uses the natural recoil of the firearm to help cycle the to help cycle the finger position of the user to more to more easily pull the trigger without necessarily a conscious decision by the user to do it. So you, with just by holding your finger in place, the bump stock uses the natural recoil because, you know, bullet comes out this end, bullet comes out this end, the laws of physics say equal and opposite force. You remember that, right? So equal opposite force coming the exact opposite direction. And so you can use that force for any number of things, such as cycling the bullet inside the frame. And you can also use it to help to help the to help recycle the 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 mechanism of shooting so that the user can just hold their finger in place and it will essentially cause the trigger to be forced into the finger of the user rather than the finger pulling the trigger so instead of the finger pulling the trigger the trigger kind of pushes against the finger if you like as a practical matter so this is a way to more quickly cycle a semi-automatic firearm it doesn't change it from full doesn't change it from semi-automatic to fully automatic although maybe it does because that's kind of the point of this discussion so we'll get there in a second but it's still for each pull of the trigger one bullet comes out it's now just that instead of the user having to move their finger back and forth the gun itself uses its own recoil to push the trigger into the finger of the user thus causing the gun to fire more natural to fire faster than a typical user would be able to fire it now i should point out here that there's strictly speaking nothing preventing the user from pulling the to, from operating the gun that fast naturally and some people can get pretty close depending on their skill and training also you don't necessarily need a bump stock to do this it's possible to do this without a bump stock it's possible to just do this without with a firearm there's particular ways of holding the firearm that will cause this to occur but obviously it's a little bit more difficult and more technical and requires some sort of skill so you don't necessarily need a bump stock to do this a bump stock just makes it a lot easier it's a lot practical it's a lot more practical it doesn't require as much it doesn't require as much skill from the user so the bump stock isn't is just facilitating what a user could do on their own if they were sufficiently skilled but makes it more easy okay great so now we have to figure out whether or not the bump stock is a machine gun all right, so what is a machine gun? Well, basically a machine gun is any part of a machine gun. And so the idea is that this 
this feature of the bump stock transforms the semi-automatic into an automatic firearm because, well, the user isn't really pulling the trigger, right? The trigger is being forced into the finger of the, the user. So it's not really the user pulling the trigger as much. So maybe that's, a, maybe that's an automatic machine. Maybe that's an automatic firearm now or close enough. All right, so bringing ourselves to the facts of the case, for over a decade, actually quite a bit longer than that, but never mind, the ATF, which is of course the federal agency that deals with firearms on the federal level, maintained that bump stocks were not machine guns as defined by the relevant statute. This is a matter of statutory interpretation. What is a machine gun? Go look at the statute, right? So the ATF said, okay, the bump stocks are not machine guns. Okie dokie. Following the October 1st, 2017 Las Vegas shooting, in which that shooter used bump stocks in the massacre, shooting from the hotel into the crowd below, public demand for ban on bump stock surge, leading to proposed legislation. So someone said, how about Congress? But before Congress could do anything, the ATF said, you know what? We don't need snow stinking Congress because, well, thanks to Chevron, which still exists for the moment, we can just change our interpretation of things magically. So the ATF said, we don't need no stinking legislation. <laughs> we don't need no stinking legislation. Therefore, they changed their stance in 2018, reclassifying bump stocks as machine guns and thus exposing owners to liability for not properly registering their machine guns under Title III. Respondent, Michael Cargill, surrendered his bump stock due to the regulation and then filed a lawsuit challenging the ATF regulation, arguing the ATF exceeded its statutory authority in defining bump stocks as machine gun. Hey, the statute doesn't say that, and you can't make it say that, is the argument. The district court ruled for the government, finding the new government's interpretation is the best interpretation of the statute, or at least is a permissible interpretation by Chevron. A panel of the United States Court of Appeal for the First Circuit agreed with the district court, but upon rehearing, the entire Fifth Circuit sitting on Bonk reversed. The on Bonk Fifth Circuit found the definition of machine gun was unambiguous as not applying to bump stocks. But even if it were ambiguous, the rule of lenity, which is a rule in criminal law that basically says if things are ambiguous, interpreted in favor of the defense, would compel a construction of the statute in Cargill's favor because this is a criminal statute, or at least a statute that has criminal penalties to it. If there's ambiguity, then you should interpret it in favor of the defendant. Thus, the question presented. Is a bump stock a machine gun as defined in 26 U.S.C. 5845B? And to figure that out, we will go look at the statute real fast together because that's always fun where we can figure this out together so here is 26 58 45 and it says here's so here's a here's what the statute says a machine gun is what is a machine gun well fortunately the congress has told you here's what it is the term machine gun means any weapon which which shoots is designed to shoot or can be readily restored to shoot automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. The term shall also include the frame or receiver of any such weapon, any part designed and intended solely and exclusively, or a combination of parts designed and intended for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun, which is arguably what the bump stock is, and any combination of parts from which the machine gun can be assembled if such parts are in the possession or under control of the person. So is this, is this a single function of the trigger, I suppose, is, is a debatable aspect, right? Because, well, the user, the trigger is still having to cycle, so it's not really a single function of the user, but, you know, hey, maybe. So with that in mind, we now turn our attention to the oral arguments. So let's go ahead and get those queued up. And let's go ahead and get started with this.
We will hear argument first this morning in case 22976, Garland versus Cargill. Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. To fire a rifle fitted with a bump stock, the shooter simply places his trigger finger on the built-in finger ledge and uses his other hand to press the front of the rifle forward. As long as the shooter maintains that steady forward pressure, the rifle will fire continuously until it runs out of bullets, and it will empty a 100-round magazine like the ones used in the Las Vegas shooting in about 10 seconds. Those weapons do exactly what Congress meant to prohibit when it enacted the prohibition on machine guns, and those weapons are machine guns because they satisfy both disputed parts of the statutory definition. First, a rifle with a bump stock fires more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. In common usage today, as in 1934, a function of the trigger happens when some act by the shooter, usually a pull, starts a firing sequence. With a semi-automatic rifle, it fires one shot for each function of the trigger because the shooter has to manually pull and release the trigger for every shot. But a bump stock eliminates those manual movements and allows the shooter to fire many shots with one act, a forward push. Now, respondent says that a separate function of the trigger happens every time the trigger on a traditional rifle moves backwards and releases the hammer, even if it moves without any further manipulation by the shooter. But that is inconsistent with contemporaneous usage, does not account for guns with other kinds of triggers, and would make it trivially easy to evade the ban on machine guns just by automating the back-and-forth movement of the trigger after the shooter's initial pull. Second, a rifle with a bump stock fires more than one shot automatically, that is, through a self-regulating mechanism. Once the shooter presses forward to fire the first shot, the bump stock uses the gun's recoil energy to create a continuous back-and-forth cycle that fires hundreds of shots per minute. A respondent says that that cycle is not automatic because the shooter has to keep up the forward pressure to keep the cycle going. But many traditional machine guns likewise require the shooter to maintain backward pressure on the trigger to maintain continuous fire. Either way, a single motion both initiates and maintains a multi-shot sequence, and either way, the weapon is a machine gun. I welcome the court's questions. So, yeah, he wants to fly right into the idea that this is a single. So this is obviously the biggest part, the biggest problem for him, is the idea that there's only a single function of the trigger, which is what the statute says, right? You need only, one, you need only a single function of the trigger. And it will keep firing because that's how a traditional machine gun works, right? You pull the trigger back and it just keeps firing. You, you only have to, to manipulate the trigger once. If you let it go, it'll obviously stop firing. But as long as you're holding the trigger back, it will keep firing. And he's so he, in a bump stock, you still have this, the trigger cycling. So you still have to bring the trigger far enough forward to reset. That may not necessarily be all the way forward. It, of course, depends on the design of the internals of the, fi and the internals of the trigger and the firearm. But typically, you don't have to bring the trigger all the way forward, although you might. Your gun might vary. But far enough forward to reset the firing mechanism. And so you do seem to have more than one operation of the trigger. And he says, well, that idea that that's not... So the fact that you do have more than one cycle is actually a single cycle based on contemporaneous usage of the term. It doesn't account for guns with other kinds of triggers. I, I suppose it doesn't, but if it had a different kind of trigger, we'd be having a completely different discussion. So I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. And it might, in fact, make it trivially easy to evade the ban on machine guns by just automating the back and forth movement of the trigger after the shooter's initial pull. But that does seem to be what the statute suggests, but he wants to say because the user is only effectively making one decision to pull it back, that's, that's, a, that's a single action by the user. That's a tough statutory, that's a tough statutory interpretation, particularly in a criminal statute where again, you're not looking to stretch criminal definitions. You want to apply definitions that are more easy to understand. So yeah, that's that seems like an odd way to go, but he wants to try to sell that. All right, let's see if he can sell it. I, I have my doubts, but let's see how it goes. Uh, Mr. Fletcher, um, how does a machine gun, what would I have to do to fire a machine gun? It depends on the machine gun. Uh, some, it's a push, of a, a push of a button. Some, it's a pull of a trigger. The statutory definition is, does it shoot more than one shot automatically by a single function of the trigger? 
but I don't have to uh, in, do anything else. I don't have to put pressure on it or anything else. It depends on the gun, again. So if you imagine, I think what your question is getting at is if you take a traditional M16 rifle, yeah. we often think of when we think of a machine gun, you're right. To fire more than one shot, you pull the trigger and you have to hold it back. And as long as you maintain that backward pressure on the trigger, it keeps shooting. With a bump stock, what would I do different? You would do different, the, the, both the initial motion and the motion that continues. It's the same thing in the sense that one motion automates back and forth movement and results in multiple shots. So what, what is motion. happening with the a trigger-initiated firing of a machine gun? What do I have to do other than depress the trigger? With a traditional machine gun, again, take an M16, and again, we think they're all machine guns, but I understand the question to be, take an M16, you pull the trigger back, and you hold it, and it keeps shooting. Okay. With, with a bump stock, you push forward, and that both initiates and continues the fire. And what is happening with the trigger when you have the recoil? That's exactly right. So I think this gets to respondents' primary argument on function of the trigger, which is that the difference with a bump stock is that it fires multiple shots automatically by automating the movement of the trigger. So my friend says the trigger moves back and forth every time a shot is fired. Our view is that those subsequent movements of the trigger aren't functions of the trigger because they're not responding to separate acts, separate pulls, or anything else by the shooter. They're just the result of... So what is happening with the trigger when someone doesn't need a bump stock to bump fire a uh, weapon. So this is the man, the unassisted manual yeah. bump firing that's described, where an expert can take a regular semi-automatic rifle and hold it loosely enough that they can do something like bump firing. And I think in our view there, too, there's just one function of the trigger because the first push starts the sequence and then the sequence continues. The ATF explained, and we agree, that that's not automatic because there's no self-regulating mechanism. The user has to So what's the, the difference? That seems a little bit difficult, too, because as I mentioned, you don't necessarily need a bump stock to do this. It, you can, a, it takes a little bit of skill and a little bit of practice, but you can achieve effectively a similar result. I won't go so far as to say identical, but you can achieve a similar result with a little bit of skill without a bump stock. A bump stock just makes it much easier. So it is a little bit unclear why one would be a machine gun and one wouldn't be. So, yeah, why? Because, again, the user is still kind of doing the same thing, right? They're only really effectively pulling the trigger once, and they're letting the recoil cycle, and they're holding it in just the right way to be in sync with the recoil cycle so that it essentially automates it. I suppose it's not self-regulating, but then again, a bump stock isn't really self-regulating either. It's just a lot easier. But it's, yeah, I don't know that that distinction makes a sense. I don't know how you say that a person firing an AR with a just a manual bump stock just by, you know, skill, why that isn't a machine gun. And if it is a machine gun, then you've kind of swallowed the distinction and everything's a machine gun. So, yeah, that's that's a good question from Justice Thomas. The same thing is happening with the trigger. The same thing is happening with the trigger, and I think that's why we would say with manual bump firing, there is just a single function of the trigger. There's one action that initiates the firing sequence. We think it's not automatic because there's no self-regulating mechanism. The user is having to do all of the work that the bump stock automates for you on a rifle fitted with a bump stock. I'm, ha what about I'm having um, it's a little trouble with the non-trigger hand. Are you just holding the gun or are you moving, uh, pushing it? forward and then back and forward and then back. So I think the best place to look for this, Mr. Chief Justice, is the district court's factual findings, which are at pages 102A to 104A of the petition appendix. And what he explained is that from the shooter's perspective, it's just one continuous forward push. The expert at trial said, mentally, you're doing nothing but pushing forward. Now, if you look and watch the slow... Continuous, continuously pushing forward or... You, in other words, are you holding it with pressure uh, or are you moving your hand? So what you are doing, I want to distinguish between those two things, actually, because yeah. what you are doing is just pushing forward. Now, if you look at the videos that we cite in footnote one of our reply brief, some of them are in slow motion, and they show that when the shooter is doing this, the hand is moving back and forth very fast, 600 times a second. That's not happening because the shooter is able to move their hand back and forth 600, or, or I'm sorry, 600 times a minute. That's not happening because the shooter can move their hand back and forth that fast. That's happening because every time a shot is fired, the recoil drives the, the rifle backwards over 
overcomes that steady forward pressure momentarily, that's what lets the trigger reset and then another shot to be fired again. So from the shooter's perspective, we view it as one act, and we think that's what the district court found. So would it be right to say that? I mean, it's not a wholly illogical idea. It does run a bit into definitional problems. The biggest problem here is just that it has criminal penalties on the rule of lenity. So, yeah, if you're trying to, it's an interesting way of framing it, an interesting way of looking at it. But to say, well, the user's only making the one decision and then allowing the natural recoil of the rifle to do its thing without essentially a decision, a decision at least as much to pull the trigger. Because with a bump stock or bump firing, you're not really making the decision to pull the trigger again. You're making the decision to keep applying the correct pressure slash correct grip to make it work, but you're not really making the decision to manipulate the trigger. So, and this is a part designed specifically for a firearm to do this. So with all due respect to all your shoelace examples out there, it doesn't quite work because this is a part that was designed for this purpose for a firearm as opposed to something that can be, um, you know, just put together by a sufficiently skilled uh, person who can just substitute parts, right? It still requires a little bit. It still requires skill. It requires skill if you're going to do this manually. It requires skill if you're going to repurpose something else. The bump stock certainly is a part specifically designed to do this and certainly makes it a lot easier for for, for a casual user. Um, so, okay, it's an interesting way of looking at it, but the fact that this is criminal is going to be the biggest problem for him. The pressure is, you know, on a typical machine gun where you're pulling and you're feeling, you know, continual backward pressure. And on this, you're feeling continual forward pressure of the opposite hand. Exactly. Is, is that right? Exactly right. I think that's exactly what the district court found. Mr. Fletcher, um, so I did watch all of these videos and try to figure out exactly what this looks like. And I just want to ask you about this bump firing thing. Mm -hmm. So what if I designed something and I call it a bump band? Because I gather you can do this with yeah. things. What about a Gatling gun? Was technically old school where you had like an old school crank? That's an interesting one. Well, Gatling gun doesn't really have a trigger, I guess, because it has a crank. I don't know how this would apply to a crank-fed gun. Although, if you had a gun that old, it's not really a firearm at all because it's older than 1898. So you're off into a complete, yes, yeah, so it's not a machine gun because it's too old. So it doesn't, so yeah, you're in, you're in a different legal analysis. I appreciate your question though hands and you can do it with your belt loop so what if i design and market something i call the bump band to help me turn my semi-automatic you know yep. in the same way why wouldn't that then be a machine gun under the statute so we think that's still not functioning automatically because that's not a self-regulating mechanism my understanding is that what those devices do is they help the shooter keep their trigger finger still but the shooter still has to manage the movement of the rifle back and forth hold it so that it moves backwards just the right distance in just the right direction then hold it again so it moves forward in just the right distance in just the right direction and what makes a bump stock different is that it's a device that is built for just this purpose. It has the finger ledge that holds your finger in place, but then it also has a sliding function built in so that when a shot is fired, the recoil automatically pushes the rifle back, lets it disengage from the trigger so the shooter doesn't have to manually release it, and then allows it to slide forward again, again, just the right distance in just the right direction. Maybe Mr. Mitchell can help me understand from his point of view what that means, because it seems like it helps you do it better and in a more stable way, but that it functions the same way. But, but the other question I have, look, intuitively, I I am entirely sympathetic to your argument. I mean, and it, and it seems like, yes, it, this is functioning like a machine gun would. But, you know, looking at that definition, I think the question is, why didn't Congress pass that litigation, I mean, that legislation to, to make this covered more clearly? Um, I think your argument depends on volition, right? So let me give you a hypothetical and then tell me if you think this satisfies the definition of machine gun. Let's imagine someone builds a fully automatic machine gun. And I won't try to come up with the technology for exactly how this is going to happen, but they install a tripwire on their property and they just leave the gun there unattended. Walk away. Somebody trips the wire and then it begins shooting lots of rounds. Yeah. 
Does that satisfy your definition of a machine gun? I think it does, yes. Why? Because a single act, and you know, I think we've used different words like volition. I think what we're, the idea that we're trying to get at is, does some separate act is that required, some manual act required for each shot, or is a single continuous act resulting in the firing of multiple shots? That's an unusual way to activate a machine gun, obviously, but I think even if it's a tripwire, that's still one act by a person that initiates a multi-shot fire. But it's an unintentional act in the same way you might say if your finger, because for the bump stock to work, you still have to have your finger right there, right? You do, yeah. And, and, it, and it, according to the Fifth Circuit, what you're focusing on is the definition, you know, it looked at it from the perspective of the gun and the machinery of the gun, but you still do need your finger there to kind of pull back the trigger the same way that you would if it was volitional. So not quite, actually, Justice Barron. I think this is important. When In the typical way that you fire these bump stocks, and this the Fifth Circuit acknowledged at 21A of the petition appendix, you don't initiate firing by pulling backward with your trigger finger. The trigger finger stays completely stationary. Push. You initiate by pushing, and what the expert said and the district court found is you could place your trigger finger with a little plastic post attached to the bump stock, and it would work in exactly the same way. So it's, it's true that you have to keep your finger there, and if you moved your finger away, the bump firing sequence would stop, but that's a pretty trivial additional piece of input from the shooter. Really, what's starting and continuing the sequence is the push forward. Thank you. Can I ask you, um, just kind of maybe stepping back a moment, why do these various distinctions with respect to operations matter? I mean, I, I read this statute to be a classification statute that Congress is directing everyone or us to identify certain kinds of weapons, and those certain kinds of weapons are being treated in a particular way. They are being prohibited. And so I guess what I'm trying to understand is if, if it's true that, um, you know, the distinction that is being focused on here is the one between the movement of the trigger going back and forth or the trigger staying the same. I'm trying to understand why that matters for the purpose of this classification. So I think we don't think it does because we don't think function of the trigger means movement of the trigger. We think it means act of the shooter. That's how it was used at the time by educated okay. speakers of English, including the president of the NRA. Okay, fair enough. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, the president of the NRA when he proposed the language that became the statute. Yeah, this is back in the uh, this is back in the days when the NRA was uh, not the organization that it would later become when they were proposing things like the Gun Control Act and stuff like that. But they think okay, function the trigger. They think function the trigger doesn't mean movement of the trigger. They think it means the act of the shoot sh shooter. Okay, that's interesting because it's a function of the trigger. That's an interesting idea. So function of the trigger means act of the shooter. But why did, okay. I don't know about that one because it's literally function of the trigger. And you're trying to make the shooter himself the, the trigger, I guess. I mean, that seems odd, but all right. When he proposed the language that became the statute to Congress, and ever since, people have equated function of the trigger with pull of the trigger. That makes perfect sense if, like us, you read function of the trigger to mean some act by the shooter. I don't think that works on my friends. But I guess I'm wondering what, what I thought your answer was going to be. We don't think it matters because something you said in the intro, which was that's uh, these are the, uh, the kind of weapons that Congress were was intending to prohibit because of the damage they cause or something like that. Like I read the word function to be doing significant work in this statute. And when, you know, function is defined, it's really not about the operation of the thing. It's about what it can achieve, what it's being used for. Yeah, so this is obviously more left-leaning thinking, legal thinking. So we can talk a little bit about where this idea is coming from that she's using on a meta level. When you're doing legal interpretation, statutory interpretation, or regulation interpretation, or constitutional interpretation, because I don't really think it matters what you're interpreting, right? The, the importance of it might matter, but the fundamental tools don't change. So when you're interpreting a statute or a constitution or anything else, there are a couple different tools that you can use sort of in, on the meta level. So you have the pure text, what it just says. You have the history, how did it come about? You have the intent, what were they trying to do? You have, or purpose, same idea, what were they trying to do? You have the, um, the overall context, the purpose, purpose is more like in the 
overall thrust of the bill or overall thrust of the thing. So what is this? What is it? What's the overall thing trying to do? And then you have policy, which is sort of the last thing, right? And so the conservative legal thinkers are going to use the text, and they're going to use history much more often. And the left-leaning people are much more likely to use purpose, right? What was the purpose behind this? So the text becomes less important than the thing that Congress was trying to do. Congress was trying to speak to an idea, and the idea is more important than literal words on the page. So that's more of a left-leaning thinking. So unsurprisingly, Justice Jackson is asking a more left-leaning idea, because she's talking about what it can be achieved, what it's used for, the purpose behind the thing, rather than the text on the page. So just to show you a little bit behind the curtain, the differences between different ideas of legal thinking. So I see Congress as putting function yeah, spirit in versus this. Letter, the function like. of this trigger is to cause this kind of damage, 800 rounds a second or whatever. And, and, and so the classification of weapons that we're trying to identify with the statute are those. I'm not an expert on such issues, but I, I don't think you can get 800 rounds a second from a bump stock. I'm not even sure there's a lot of machine guns you can get 800 rounds a second from. That's a lot of rounds. 800 rounds a second? What kind of gun is this? Is this an A-10 Warthog or something? Jeez. That function in that same way. So, Justice Jackson, I agree with most of that, but I want to be careful because our, our view is not that because Congress banned machine guns because they're dangerous, anything that's dangerous or that shoots fast is a machine gun. Our, we draw the evident purpose of Congress that we think my friend's interpretation would frustrate from the text that Congress enacted. Right. And so how about anything in which the trigger functions in the same way? And by function, I don't know that that necessarily means it has to move in the same way. It has to operate in the same way. It can function in the same way insofar as it automatically allows for 800 rounds to be released. Um, okay, not for nothing, but once again, we're talking about semi-automatic firearms. So if anyone knows, because this is a bump stock, that's the whole thing, right? It's a bump stock on an, on an otherwise semi-automatic. So if anyone knows where I can buy an 800 round mag for my semi-automatic rifle, please let me know. Big, Big Mac. Big, Big Mac. So, exactly. We think the function of the trigger is what lets the shooter start the firing sequence, and we think all of the parts of this statutory definition are aimed at, we're worried about guns that let you shoot many shots without repeated manual actions, right? So it's, it's a single function of the trigger. Does the shooter have to do one thing or many things? Mr. Thank Fletcher, you. On, on that score, can we just step back a minute? Um, I, I can certainly understand why these items should be made illegal. Um, but we're dealing with a statute that was enacted in the 1930s. And uh, through many administrations, uh, the government took the position that these bump stocks are not machine guns. Um, and then you, you adopted an interpretive rule. Brandon Herrera has an 800 round backpack belt mag. Okay. Fine. Not even a legislative rule saying otherwise that would render between a quarter of a million and a half million people <clears throat> federal felons um, and not even through an APA process they could challenge, subject to 10 years in federal prison. Um, and the only way they can challenge it is if they're prosecuted. And they may well wind yeah. up dispossessed. Yeah, the, 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 the lower is going to melt from that. This is, this is also a good point. Um, if we're putting 800 rounds a second through this uh, AR-15, I guess, um, what exactly are we making the AR-15 out of that it's going to be able to deal with that much heat? Um, that's a really good question. Um I, I, I don't know what we can possibly use. Yeah, it's going to be tough. <laughs> Best of guns, all guns in the future, as well as a lot of other civil rights, including the right to vote. And I, I guess I just want your reaction to, to that 
and I believe there were a number of members of Congress, including uh, Senator Feinstein, who said that this administrative action forestalled legislation that would have dealt with this topic directly rather than trying to use. Can you make a gun out of those tiles they used to use for the space shuttle? Could you make a gun out of that? Maybe you could do that. That might work. It's a nearly 100 year old statute in a way that many administrations hadn't anticipated. Thoughts? There's a lot packed in there, so as you might expect, I have a lot of thoughts. I think the main one is this court often concludes that the government has interpreted a statute the wrong way and doesn't hesitate to correct the government's mistakes. I think the government should do the same thing. After the Las Vegas shooting, the deadliest shooting in our nation's history, I think it would have been irresponsible for the ATF not to take another closer look at this prior interpretation, which was reflected in a handful of classification letters, and to look at the problem more carefully. And having done that, I think it would have been irresponsible if the ATF can Included as it did that these devices are prohibited under the best reading of the statute for the ATF not to fix it. Then why not do a legislative rule properly and in which I, I know you did notice and comment, but it was an interpretive rule and an interpretive rule you can more or less just. Of course it was. Of course it is. This is this is just this is how far Chevron has gone, right? Because on, at least at least under Chevron, they still had to do things by you know changing the rule which meant going through the Administrative Procedures Act. But some time ago, the executive branch agencies discovered we have a new trick. Rather than change the rule, we'll just change our interpretation of the rule, which doesn't require any notice or comment or anything else. So it's rulemaking without rulemaking. So it wasn't even done through, it wasn't even a rule done through the Administrative Procedures Act and formal notice and all the rest of the thing. It was literally just them making stuff up on the back of a napkin and be like, well, this is the law now. Chevron's got to die. Chevron's got to die hard. Issue. I'm, and you don't even have to put it in the Federal Register. I mean, it, maybe you do in some circumstances, but not all. Well, just and and, and you're, you're, you're creating a class of, again, between a quarter of a million and a half million people who have in reliance on past administrations, Republican and Democrat, who said that this does not qualify under a very old statute, taken actions. And an interpretive rule, you can't even challenge an APA posture. Well, we are in an APA posture. They are challenging an interpretive rule. Well, I understand and, that, but in your reply brief, you say, oh, don't touch that, because that's not before us. That's not part of the QP. And in an interpretive rule, you don't get an APA challenge. You get, you, you get a criminal prosecution against you is what you get. So I, I, I guess I disagree with that on a number of levels. First, I would think it would be better for those who are concerned about administrative power that we acknowledge this is an interpretive rule. The ATF doesn't have the power to make something a crime that wasn't a crime before. It's not a crime to violate the rule. It has been and always will be a crime to violate the statute. Yeah, so this is exactly what they're saying, right? It, we're not changing the statute. We're not changing the regulation. We're, this, effectively, this has always been a crime. This has always been a crime and we just noticed. So a lot of people have been violating the law for a long time. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. It is, in fact, not a crime to violate the rule. That's technically correct, and that's kind of correct, but yeah. Hmm. The ATF is saying we got that wrong before and we're fixing it now. And you're right. It would be horribly unfair to prosecute people who possess these devices in reliance on the agency's past assurance. But that is taken care of through doctrines like entrapment by a sopple, which ensure that no one has been and no one will be prosecuted for possessing these guns during or these devices during a time when ATF said it was legal. But that's not a reason to shackle the ATF and certainly not a reason to shackle this court to adopt something other than the best reading of the words Congress wrote. And it's true. Congress wrote those words. 90 years ago, but we think it used capacious language, like function of a trigger instead of pull of a trigger. And then in 1968, added parts that can be used to convert something into a machine gun, precisely because it understood that Americans are have a lot of ingenuity and a lot of creativity. There are a lot of ways to build something that is a machine gun, and I don't think you should hesitate from applying the broad language that Congress wrote, consistent with the meaning that it has always had. What's Could the... I... <laughs> Thank you. Um, are you representing on behalf of the government that you're not going to prosecute anyone prior to 2017, anyone who wasn't a felon or, or disqualified for some other reason? 
I am. ATF made very clear in enacting this rule that anyone who turned in their bump stock or destroyed it before March of 2018 would not face prosecution. As a practical matter, also, the statute of limitations for this offense is five years, so in a month, the statute of limitations would be gone. We have not prosecuted those people. We won't do it. And if we tried to do it, I think they would have a good defense based on entrapment bias. Second, um, the back and forth here leads me to believe that at best there might be some ambiguity. Now the question is, what's the best reading? And we have a whole slew of doctrines that talk about that with respect to um, that we shouldn't render statutes ineffective by an interpretation. That's not the best reading, mm -hmm. correct? Correct, exactly. And I think um, we've said that as far back as 1824. In the Emily, exactly. In the Emily case. And so I think your position is, if anyone's in doubt about this interpretation, that not including something that basically you hold in your hand and you let the recoil move it back and forth, if that's not automatic, then it doesn't make any sense that this is not a machine gun, correct? That's part of our argument, absolutely. And it's not just this device. I mean, we cite a number of the examples, in the, and there are many more, of things that people have done to try to get around the ban on machine guns. And accepting some of the interpretations that my friend is offering today would legalize not just bump stocks, but those devices as well. One final question. Uh, Justice Barrett said something about she hoped Mr. Mitchell would uh, explain something about why there was a difference in the functioning between the belt and the gun. Could you go through that again so that I think I understand it, but... Of course. Right. So as I acknowledge and as the ATF explained in the rule, it is possible to do bump firing, meaning that the rifle moves back and forth and bumps against your stationary finger. An expert can do that without any assistive device at all. And you can also do it if you have a lot of expertise by hooking your finger into a belt loop or using a rubber band or something else like that to hold your finger in place. We don't think those things function automatically because the definition of automatically, I think everybody he agrees is by means of a self-regulating mechanism. Is it really self Is it really a self-regulating mechanism? I mean, I don't know that it is. I mean, yes, it, if you have expertise, if you have some skill, <coughs> it's not like it requires, well, he says a lot of expertise. It doesn't require a lot of expertise, but it does require some. Yeah, you can hook your finger into a boot, boot, belt loop to accomplish a similar goal or use a rubber band. And then he says, we don't think those fun things function automatically. Because self-regulating, that's what a bump stock is. Would, would you say that a bump stock, would you guys describe a bump stock as a self-regulating mechanism? Would you guys describe as a bump stock that way? Because I'm not, I'm not sure about that. No, not the, not auto sear. Because we're talking about a, we're talking about a semi-automatic. So there's no auto sear because this is a semi-automatic. So would you guys describe a bump stock as self-regulating? It's a stock with a spring. Yeah, I mean, I know what it is functionally. Eh, I don't know. That's what a bump stock is. It's a device that is purpose-built to harness the recoil energy of the gun, to automate the process of releasing the trigger, to move the rifle back just the right distance in just the right direction so that the trigger resets, and then to ensure that the rifle moves forward again, again, just the right distance, just the right direction. We think the cycle that's created by that means is by means of a self-regulating process. It's possible to do the same thing with a lot of manual work and manual control and expertise, but that's not unusual to say that something can be done automatically by a device if you eliminate a lot of manual movements that someone like an expert could take to do this. Can I ask you about uh, mens rea to pick up on Justice Gorsuch's questions uh, for prosecuting someone uh, now? What uh, mens rea showing would the government have to make to uh, convict someone? So I think the relevant case is Staples, and I think what the court held in Staples is that you have to be aware of the facts that render your weapon. So even... Um, if you are not aware of the legal prohibition, you can be convicted. That's right. But that's true of all machine guns. I mean, all different sorts of devices. I think the distinct problem here is the one that's created by the fact that the agency was previously saying that these were not machine guns. We acknowledge that those people who, in reliance I mean, on that, that... That's going to ensnare a lot of people who are not aware of the legal prohibition. 
So I guess I don't think so, Justice Kavanaugh. I think the ATF, one of the reasons to Justice Gorsuch's point, this is an interpretive rule that went through notice and comment. The reason was in part because the agency knew that it had previously been saying something different. It wanted to maximize public notice. This is something that's gotten why, why not? Um, <laughs> why not? Uh, require the government to also prove that the person knew that what they were doing was wrongful, was illegal. Yeah, well, I, I think that's not the understanding that this court adopted in Staples. Uh, if the court wanted to revisit that in another case, a criminal case, you could. We haven't briefed that question here. But I think to the extent that you're concerned about that, it's, it's not a concern unique to bump stocks. We mentioned all sorts of other devices, the forced reset trigger that we mentioned. The, the problem of people coming up with devices that they want, to, that they think get close to the line but don't go over, but that in fact go over the line and turn them into machine guns isn't new and could come up anywhere. The problem here we acknowledge is ATF used to say something different about the but we think that's taken care of by the rulemaking and the doctrine of entrapment. By because people will sit down and read the Federal Register. No, I think because people who have these that's devices. What they do in their evening for fun. <laughs> and gun owners across the country crack it open next to the fire and the dog. I, I take that point. I think, Justice Gorsuch, the fact that this rulemaking happened has not gone unnoticed in the community. Yeah, uh, not for nothing, but if you want to read the Federal Register, that's, that's a lot of reading. They, they polish it every day. It's a lot. Yeah, good luck keeping up on that. Yeah. Yeah. I might crack it open by the campfire, but it's probably just me. I haven't seen a physical copy of the, physical, of the Federal Register, though, since law school, though, so... Mm. Community of people who are interested in firearms. Uh, many people have availed themselves of the right to challenge our interpretation. We're defending it in court. The Supreme Court is hearing it. I, I agree. Not everyone is going to find out about those things, but we've done everything the government could possibly do to Let make Let me it. ask you about the function of the trigger. You liken it to a stroke of a key or, or, a, or, mm. or a throw of the dice or a swing of the bat. Those are all things people do. Mm -hmm. um, a function of the trigger. Do people function triggers? I, I thought, you know, in, in, in you know, perhaps maybe somewhere in fifth, fifth grade grammar, I learned that was an intransitive verb. Yeah. And people don't function things. They may pull things, they may throw things, but they don't function things. And again, it is a very old statute, and it was designed for an obvious problem in the 1930s, and Al Capone, and people were with a single function of the trigger. That is, the thing itself was moved once. And that's what they wrote. And maybe they should have written something better. One might hope they might write something better in the future. But that's the language we're stuck with. Help me. That is the language we're stuck with, but I don't think it's as narrow as you suggest for a couple of reasons. I agree it's awkward to talk about a person functioning a trigger, but there's an easy explanation. The reason Congress used that word, not pull, is because Congress knew that there were lots of different ways to activate a trigger. I went to the Federal Register just to check for my own edification. 224 pages today on the Federal Register. 92 notices, six presidential documents, three proposed rules, 12 new rules, and two significant documents on the Federal Register. Every single day, ma'am. Every single day. Mm and wanted to cover all of them. And I think the reason you know that it's referring to what the shooter does, there are really two. One is that's the way it's been understood ever since. The interpretation I'm giving you is the same one Carl Frederick, the president of the NRA, and many other courts, executive officials, congressmen gave at the same time. They used pull and function interchangeably. And second, I think even if you've said we're going to focus just on the trigger, the function of an object isn't just some action by the object. It's the mode of action by which it fulfills its purpose. And the purpose of a trigger is to accept some input from the user. And the way you know that is how everyone reacts when someone attacks to some contraption, like the auto glove, which is a glove that you put on and you push a button and it has a little piston that pulls the trigger really fast. Or you attach a fishing reel, like the one the Fifth Circuit confronted in camp, where you flip a switch and it spins and turns the trigger over and over again. On my friend's reading, the function of the trigger with those devices is exactly the same, because the curved metal lever is moving back and it's releasing the hammer every single time. But everyone, my friend included recognizes that that's not the function of the trigger in those devices. The function of the trigger is the user's flip of the switch or push of the button, because that's the thing that allows an act by the user to initiate a firing sequence. Mr. Fletcher, I, I take it that the ATF defined the curved lever that you pull back as the trigger. Could it have defined the bump stock itself as the trigger? 
So I'm not sure that it could have defined the bump stock itself as the trigger. I think we get into this a little bit in the reply in response, or a, ver a different argument maybe than the one that you're thinking of, but I think related in response to a move that's made in the red brief, where we hypothesize uh, that if you had a machine gun that required you to pull the trigger and also hold down a button, it would still fire automatically, and we all understand that, even though you have to do two things rather than one. And what my friend said in the red brief is, well, in that case, maybe the button is part of the trigger, too, because you have to push the button to keep firing. And what we say in the reply, and My what I think is true, is that it is if you were going the to the button, the push the that way, button, which isn't the way the ATF has, I think you'd still land in the same place because then you'd say it's both the curved metal lever and it's the part on the front of the rifle that the user pushes forward in order to initiate and maintain the firing sequence. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito. What is the situation of people who have possessed bump stocks between the time of the ATF's? new rule and the present day, or between the time of the new rule and the Fifth Circuit decision? Can they be prosecuted? I think probably yes, unless they had gotten some judicial relief uh, from the rule. The rule has not been enjoined. It hasn't been vacated writ large. So I think the, the government has made clear that this is what we think the statute means. I'll say in practice— Isn't that disturbing? People in the Fifth Circuit who've been possessing firearms since the beginning of 2023, uh, let's say they— you know, they are aware of the Fifth Circuit's decision that they can be criminally prosecuted for doing something that the Court of Appeals that governs their territory has said is not illegal? Well, let me give a practical answer and then a doctrinal answer. I think practically I'm not aware of a lot of these prosecutions being brought because we recognize that there is some legal uncertainty. But I think doctrinally that could happen all the time, Justice Alito. Circuits disagree about what a criminal law means, and someone might, in reliance on their circuit precedent, do something that they think is lawful under circuit precedent that other circuits disagree with, that the government disagrees with, and that this court ultimately holds as covered by the statute. When we speak of the function of an um, I'm struggling to think that that's correct. Um, if you have by if you have binding circuit precedent that says something's legal, and then you do it, and then the Supreme Court says no, that was wrong. Really, you can go back and prosecute those people. Um, I know that's the rule in Canada, but, uh, okay, I don't know about that answer. That seems wrong. Adamant object. Don't we normally look at what that inanimate object, uh, object does? So, uh, why isn't the function of a trigger to release the hammer, uh, let's it's not an ex post facto law because the law itself hasn't changed, just the interpretation of the law. Look at the, the, the M16, the AR-15, the function of the, why isn't the function of the trigger to release the hammer from the sear so that the hammer can swing forward and strike? Isn't that the most straightforward interpretation of this? I don't think so, and I think even if you thought that was true, just looking at the text alone, the three indications that we've talked about, the contemporaneous usage by the president of the NRA and others, the application to other kinds of triggers, which everybody agrees are covered, but which don't function by moving the hammer, and then also just evasion. I mean, I talked about some of them, but one of the devices that the Fifth Circuit has held is permissible, or I'm sorry, a district court in the Fifth Circuit has held is permissible, and the Fifth Circuit has declined to stay, is something called a forced reset trigger. And with a forced reset trigger, the ATF tested it zip tied the trigger back and the gun shot multiple bullets. What the district court said is that under my friend's interpretation, it's function there are multiple functions of the trigger because the trigger is wiggling back and forth imperceptibly and releasing the hammer separately each time, and so it's not a machine gun. And I think it's just not reasonable to read the statute that opens it up to that sort of evasion, and we're seeing concrete evidence of that evasion in the Fifth Circuit. Thank you. Justice Sotomayor? Just to be clear, when you're citing what Congress people said or what the NRA president said, or what we said in some of our decisions, because we've used mm. pull of the trigger in describing a machine gun's function, correct? Exactly. Um, you're not using legislative history in the traditional sense. You are pointing to common usage, 
Exactly right. Exactly right. We're not speculating. We're not saying that the bump stocks are machine guns because the president of the NRA wanted them to be. We're using that as evidence. Well, that's what the Senate intended. You're saying it's a term of art. Exactly. If he, if he had published this in an essay or in the New York Times, we would be pointing to it as evidence of contemporary meaning. We certainly don't think it should be no, less you're pointing, you're pointing to Supreme Court decisions that did it. Exactly. As this court does, too. It looks at literature. It looks at all sorts of sources to understand what it, speakers of English understand the words to mean when Congress used them. And we think this and many other things are powerful indications that we're right about that. Interesting idea. So you're not trying to use it as legislative history. You're trying to use it as evidence of what the term meant in colloquial usage. I don't think that's really going to fly here either, but an interesting which way to try to split the difference. Okay. Mrs. Kagan? Uh, Mr. Fletcher, you've talked a lot about the mechanics of these various devices. Could you give a sense of the different effects of these various devices? So you take on uh, two poles, a semi-automatic weapon, let's say, and a conventional machine gun on the, on the other. Um, how many bullets in how much time? And then um, one of these bump stock weapons, uh, where does that fall in the spectrum between those? Sure. So the rate of a semi-automatic weapon is not a fixed number because it depends both on the weapon and very much on the skill of the shooter. I think the Giffords amicus brief says the theoretical maximum for a very skilled competition shooter with a specialized weapon is something like 180 bullets a minute. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. So a a user not a user not doing a bump manipulation, just a user just pulling the trigger par normal. They think a very skilled. They think a very skilled shooter could sh could pull the trigger three times every second. Uh, okay. Um, all right. <laughs> In practice, it's much much slower than that for the vast majority of people who would use one of these things. I mean, Jerry Mikulak can do that, but you know, not everyone's Jerry Mikulak. A fully automatic weapon. How, how much slower? Uh, I think you know it, it depends. Uh, I think more on the order of you know sixty something like that. I don't. I don't want to represent that that's exact again because there's a lot of variation. But, but the, the point is that's the theoretical max in <laughs> practice. Significantly slower than that. A traditional machine gun like the M16 or the M14, things that are issued to members of the American military, shoots in the range of 700 to 950 bullets a minute. There are obviously bigger things like the things mounted on helicopters that shoot much much faster than that. But I think for these purposes, that 700 to 900 is about the right benchmark. The Aikens accelerator, the original bump stock shot at 650 rounds a minute, and the devices at issue here are re represented to shoot between 400 and 800 rounds a minute. So right in that range with the M16, the M14. And they do it in the way, again, I, I think rates of fire are important, but we acknowledge this is not a rate of fire statute. It's a function statute. But the function was, are you able to fire multiple shots without multiple manual movements? And I think the rate of fire is powerful evidence that there are not multiple manual movements going on here. Thank you. I guess when I was thinking three shots a second, I was also presupposing that the person was trying to do it with accuracy, which is obviously a lot harder. If you just want to pull the trigger three times a second, then yeah, but if you're actually trying to, you know, get the bullet to go where you're trying to theoretically aim, that's that's a little bit more challenging. So I was factoring in, you know, the bullet going at the target in my in my skepticism. This is Horst. This is Kavanaugh. You've referred a lot to the language in 1934 and around that time, but of course bump stocks didn't exist around that time. What are we to make of that? So I think you still apply the language and you have to do what you have to do a lot, which is apply language that Congress wrote and apply it to something that didn't exist at the time. You know, none of these workarounds, the fishing reel, the auto glove, the force reset trigger, all of them are new problems. But, but I think what you can draw is that Congress wrote a statute, chose the word function deliberately because it didn't want to just work, focus on triggers that pull. And then in 1968, it added parts that convert a machine, a, a normal gun into a machine gun because it recognized that people try to do things to semi-automatic weapons in order to give them these same characteristics of multiple rounds with a single manual action. And then what's your explanation, maybe common sense explanation or some other explanation for why when this does become an issue, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, Senator Feinstein, 
all say no. Yeah. Uh, bump stocks are, are not covered because if it were so, I don't want to use the word clear, but it's so if your, if your position were correct, oh, just this is a new thing, obviously covered by this old statutory language, you would expect the Bush administration, the Obama administration, Senator Feinstein to say, of course it's covered by, it. and, and they didn't, and that's reason for pause. It does, it's not dispositive, but it's reason for pause. And I just, what, what's your explanation for that if you have one? So I agree with you. It's, it's, it's worth looking at. It's worth asking. And I think that's why it's so important to put it in context. And, and if I could, so when the ATF first looks at these, it's the Aikens accelerator in 2002. That's the bump stock with a spring in the back where you don't even have to push forward. And initially ATF tests it, the prototype breaks, but the ATF writes a classification letter, which is something relatively informal, just goes to the manufacturer, doesn't contain a lot of legal reasoning, says this isn't a machine gun because it doesn't have multiple functions of the trigger. Very quickly thereafter, ATF corrects that error, and in 2006 says the Aikens accelerator is a machine gun because it does function by, it does shoot multiple shots by a single function of the trigger. So that part, we've been consistent on. The director of the ATF issued a ruling, 2006-2, that was consistent on that, and the agency has held that position ever since. And that's mostly what we've talked about today. It's true that in a series of additional, uh, another informal classification letters issued between 2007 and 2017, the ATF said that non-mechanical bump stocks, those like the ones at issue here without a spring where you have to push forward, weren't machine guns because they didn't shoot automatically. But I, I think it's important to recognize those are informal. They don't include a lot of legal analysis. And I think maybe most importantly, no one defends the ATF's interpretation from those letters. What the ATF said there is this doesn't have springs or mechanical parts. So it doesn't make guns the, the gun function automatically. I think even my friend doesn't defend that interpretation. Everybody recognizes that there are things like Glock switches that we discuss in our reply brief that you can add to a machine gun, a semi-automatic weapon that make it a machine gun. And I think the fact that no one is defending the ATF's prior interpretation is a good indication that when Attorney General Sessions and Attorney General Barr revisited this and we've continued to defend it since, they did a much more careful examination and got it right. And then Senator Feinstein, you know, I, I take your point. I guess with all respect to Senator Feinstein, I would say that the comments from a legislator who's trying to get a piece of legislation passed and is trying to demonstrate the need for that legislation by disagreeing with the administration about the scope of current law. Yeah, so, fa so yeah, so this is an interesting position for this is an interesting position for the uh, US government and their answer isn't wholly invalid, but you do have to appreciate the irony, right? Senator Feinstein goes into the halls of the Senate and be like, "You know what would be really great? What if we had a piece of legislation that made these bump stops illegal?" because the current law doesn't make them illegal. So we need a law to make them, Ill make them illegal. And now it's like, well, I, that's what Senator Feinstein didn't think that they're illegal. And so he has to throw, he has to throw Senator Feinstein under the bus. You know, ah, she was just, she was just saying things for the purpose of getting them passed. You know, I wouldn't worry about her comments too much. She doesn't know what she's talking about. And certainly not as positive of what people in 1930 thought. I do appreciate throwing Senator Feinstein on, under the bus. That's fun. I enjoy that are not a particularly probative source of the meaning of the words that Congress enacted in 1934. Thank you. Justice Barrett? Justice Jackson? Can I just be clear on this function point? Because um, they say, I think, that a single function of the trigger, in, as it appears in this statute, is directing consideration of whether the trigger is moving only once. And I think you're saying that, no, when it says the function of the trigger, it's not how the trigger operates. It's the function of the trigger is what it achieves. And the function um, that I think you're saying is that if by single operation, meaning single movement of the person, mm -hmm. you can achieve firing multiple shots without multiple manual movements, that's what you said, yeah. um, that covers the function of the trigger. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. And I think the thing that makes this clearest is the boxes hypothetical on page 30 of our brief, where we say, imagine somebody builds a black box with a button on the top, and the shooter pushes the button once, and bullets come out of the front at a very high rate. On our view, that's a machine gun. But on my friend's view, if the inventor sets it up so that after the shooter pushes and releases the button, the button keeps moving up and down in the same way on its own, I think he's stuck saying that that's not a machine gun because the trigger is functioning each time a shot is fired. We don't think that's a plausible construction. You know, the more and more I listen to him, he is actually making a pretty sound legal case, which is kind of annoying. It gets down to the interpretation of the statute with respect to what the function of the trigger is. What is a functioning of the trigger? And he does, he does point out by reasonable analogies that if you had 
certain that it maybe it doesn't mean just pulling the trigger. There's a distinction between a function of the trigger and a pulling of the trigger. So you could have the user pushes the magic button and only pushes it once and the magic button somehow causes the trigger to be pulled and then released and then pulled and then released by some sort of automatic mechanism. Doesn't really matter how it's working because it's hypothetical, it's hypothetical law land, right? You just have a magic button that somehow causes the trigger to be pulled and then released and pulled and released somehow. And would that not be a machine gun? Because while the, the, the trigger is being actuated in some sense only once by the magic button. So the user's only making the one decision, which is analogous to the holding the trigger back. They both have the same functionality. Maybe the magic button requires you to hold down the magic button just the same way that the, the uh, machine gun requires you to hold back the trigger. And this particular magic button works by actually not changing the sear, but by just changing how it pulls the trigger. Is that not a machine gun? It's it's not a wholly ludicrous point. I think I my 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 bigger problem with this is my bigger problem with this is not that it's a wholly ludicrous point. I think my bigger problem with this is just the the mechanisms by which the ATF went about doing this. Because they just were like, well, we're just going to magically change our interpretation even though we've been saying exactly the opposite for 10 years and now we can reframe it this way and suddenly that becomes effective just by magical wishing uh, without proper notice or comment or formal rulemaking or anything else, right? They just do it by interpretive guidance. So I, I think my bigger problem is the, is the procedural mechanism by which this came to be. He's not, he's not making a point that is completely logically ludicrous. It's, it's, whether or not that's what Congress had in mind, I mean, we can go back to the to the statute very briefly and see if this is what Congress had in mind. Because they talk about any weapon which shoots automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. So what does it mean to have a single function of the trigger? And then, of course, any part designed and intended solely and exclusively, so your shoestring doesn't work because it's not designed and intended solely and exclusively for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun. So it gets down to this idea of what does it mean to have a single function of the trigger? And is that different than pulling the trigger? And he gives some examples to, to show why it might be. It's, I think my bigger problem is at this point the procedural mechanisms by how it came to be. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, whole, yeah. Two Truth for Liberty also points, not wholly ludicrous, but that means alternative reasonable explanations, which means rule of lenity. That is certainly a very plausible counter interpretation as well, because if, if it's susceptible to multiple meetings, the rule of lenity is definitely one way to say this should be resolved. And Jiminy says, but that's a Chevron issue and a problem with the statute, or not a problem with the statute. Yeah, well, that may be very well true. Maybe, maybe it is just a Chevron problem, but then again, I don't like Chevron. So yeah, maybe that's, I mean, I haven't deep dived into it enough. Maybe this is what Congress had in mind and the language is certainly, it's not a ludicrous interpretation, so. The more, I, the more, I mean, you know, I have to be, I have to be an intellectually honest broker, guys. I mean, you know, as always, the more I listen to him, the more what he's saying seems like a plausible read of the statute and his examples showing various things are, to illustrate the point, are pretty reasonable. So, um, you know, Chevron does not apply in criminal law. That's also true. You're correct. So yeah, this is, that's fair. So Chevron... Chevron might be the wrong way to think about this completely, which, you know, also, also fair. So because this has criminal, because this has criminal aspects, Chevron is the wrong way to think about it completely. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's completely true. That's fair. That's a fair point. Very well, very well pointed out. Yeah, Lenity and Chevron were not argued during this case. 
Well, Chevron probably wasn't, but because that's a fair point. I'm not sure about Lenity, but you might be right. I think you're right about Chevron. Fair. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. Well noted. So we'll ask him about that. And and I guess yours is consistent or it, it accounts for automatically more than one shot being in this definition. Exactly. A, okay. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. I'd be very surprised if the rule of lenity didn't make an appearance in the briefs somewhere. May not have come up in oral arguments, but I'd be surprised if it wasn't in the briefs. Let's listen to this other guy because that was a pretty good job by the government. So I'm interested to see what this other guy has to say. Maybe he can sell me on a different interpretation. Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The statutory definition of machine gun extends only to weapons that fire more than one shot automatically by a single function of the trigger. Mr. Cargill's non-mechanical bump stocks fall outside the statutory definition for two separate and independent reasons. First, a bump stock equipped rifle can fire only one shot per function of the trigger because the trigger must reset after every shot and must function again before another shot can be fired. The trigger is the device that initiates the firing of the weapon. And the function of the trigger is what that triggering device must do to cause the weapon to fire. The phrase function of the trigger can refer only to the trigger's function. Yep. It has nothing to do with the shooter or what the shooter does to the trigger because the shooter does not have a function. That's fair. The statute is concerned only with what the trigger does and whether a single function of that trigger produces more than one shot. Second, a bump stock equipped rifle does not and cannot fire more than one shot automatically by a single function of the trigger because the shooter, in addition to causing the trigger to function, must also undertake additional manual actions to ensure a successful round of bump firing. Everything about the bump firing process is manual and there is no automating device such as a spring or a motor in any of Mr. Cargill's non-mechanical bump stocks. The process mm -hmm. depends entirely on human effort and exertion. Yeah, no automated device such as, a, such as a spring or motor. So there is no regulating mechanism in this thing. Yeah. Very good. As the shooter must continually and repeatedly thrust the forestock of the rifle forward with his non-shooting hand, while simultaneously maintaining backward pressure on the weapon with his shooting hand. None of these acts are automated, and the Solicitor General has yet to identify any component of Mr. Cargill's devices that automatically performs any task that is necessary for bump firing. The statute is unambiguous as applied to Mr. Cargill's non-mechanical bump stocks, and we ask the court to affirm on that ground. I mean, you know, it's just a completely, this is also a very good interpretation of the statute and also flows very nicely. Just, you know, it's a very plausible read of the thing. And the fact that there's no automating device, spring as motor, the fact that there is no regulating me mechanism, such as a spring or motor in any of these bump stocks, I think goes a long way towards development of the point. So I, you know, I like the way he begins his argument. It's a good... It's a good summary of his position. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's what you want to be. All right, cool. Um, behind the government's argument is a sense that the this statute was initially enacted because of uh, what some of the uh, uh, individuals did uh, during uh, prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, and there was significant damage from machine guns, uh, carnage, uh, people dying, et cetera. And the, behind this is the notion that the bump stop does the exact same thing. So with that background, why shouldn't we uh, look at a broader definition of function, uh, one suggested by the, uh, uh, the government, as opposed to just the narrow function that you suggest. The problem with the government's argument, Justice Thomas, is that the phrase single function of the trigger can only be construed grammatically to focus on the trigger's function and not on what the shooter does to the trigger. And that's so for many reasons. For, for one thing, there cannot be a subject of function because a shooter does not function a trigger. Only a trigger can have a function and not a shooter. Now, the Solicitor General is trying to replace the word function in the statute with the word pull, 
And if the statute had actually said a single pull of the trigger, that phrase would clearly refer to an act taken by the shooter. Because only a shooter can pull the trigger. The trigger certainly can't pull itself. So if the court is going to interpret the statute based on what it says, rather than based on the purposes or perhaps the overarching goals of what the 1934 legislature might have been, there's no way it could accept the government's construction of the statute because it is changing the enacted words. Can I give you a way, possibly? Please. <laughs> all right. So the statute says function, as we've all identified. Yes. Um, and as far as I can tell, the sort of common usage of the word function is not its operational design. It's not the mechanics of the thing. It is what it achieves, what it's being used for. So I found definitions. Function is defined as the action for which a person or thing is specifically fitted or used. The acts or operations expected of the person or thing. So if you take that definition, mm -hmm. it seems to me that through its use of the word function, Congress was trying to capture a class of weapons in which a trigger is used once to achieve a certain result, which says in the statute, automatic firing many times. Oh. And so weapons with bump stocks have triggers that function in the same way. They, you, through a single, right, pull of the trigger or you touch of the trigger, you achieve the same result of automatic fire no. uh, of the weapon. So why, why is that inconsistent with grammar or the, the, the way the statute reads? Well, the, the premise of Your Honor's question is not true. A single discharge of the trigger produces only one shot. It doesn't produce a round of automatic fire. The only way you get to repeated shots with a bump stock equipped rifle is for the shooter himself to continually undertake manual action by thrusting the four stock of the rifle forward with his non-shooting hand. But that's not so, the trigger. He's only touched the, he's holding the trigger or touched the trigger once, right? No, he touches the trigger every single time. He has to bump oh, I'm the trigger. sorry, the machine is, but the machine is moving. The machine, to make the his, machine is moving, but okay. the trigger has so to be bumped. So then let me ask you a question. Yes. The, the other question is, I understood this to be a classification statute in the sense that Congress is trying to identify and classify certain weapons. So if you're right, mm -hmm. I want to understand why that matters. Why does it matter for the purpose of this statute that we have backwards pressure um, in the ordinary case of a machine gun and forward pressure here? Um, you, you're saying there's a distinction being drawn. Bump stocks don't fit into this category because of this distinction. And I guess I don't understand why Congress would have prohibited one and not the other. Why, why does it matter? Well, it matters because the statute turns on whether the bump stock equipped rifle will fire more than one shot automatically by a single function. Right, of the but there, the, so the, the, that, the statute is in, con, in context. The yes. statute is classifying certain weapons for prohibition. Right. So for it to make sense, we have to understand why this category of weapons are ones that Congress wants to prohibit. And you're suggesting that Congress is prohibiting through this classification weapons in which we hold it backwards and automatic fire happens, but we push it forward and automatic fire happens. Congress says no. There's no That's automatic not fire. I'm sorry, Justice Jackson. There okay. is no automatic fire. Sorry, 800, 800 bullets. I, I, the, the conversation with Justice Kagan suggested that through a bump, bump stock, you can achieve the same kinds of result in terms of the amounts of bullets that are being uh, ejected. That is, is that true. Correct? It has okay. a very high rate of fire, but it's not automatic. Right. But right. what I'm this suggesting is... is that the category of prohibition is about the high rate of fire as opposed to, you know, the movement of the trigger. And if you're right that it's about the movement of the trigger, I'm just asking why. Why would, why would Congress want to prohibit certain things based on whether the trigger is moving as opposed to certain things that can achieve this you know, lethal kind of spray of bullets. Um, okay. I, 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 I object to this. I object to this line of argument very deeply. Um, look, <laughs> the, the statute says function of the trigger. Now, as I sort of indicated earlier, uh, I, as the government was sort of making ideas that, were sort of making sense to me. I was like, maybe there's a way to think about this. Well, function of the trigger isn't the same thing as pull the trigger. And maybe we can think of what the bump stop stock is doing is maybe we can think of that in some sense as a single function of the trigger. Despite the fact that it's having to cycle the trigger, maybe we can call that a single function of the trigger. 
I was like, okay, maybe there's an idea over here that might make sense. But Justice Jackson over here has decided that the word trigger no longer matters in the statute at all, apparently. So that's, that's an interesting way to go about it. So when Congress said, you know, the issue is the functioning of the trigger, what they really meant was the high rate of fire. And why would Congress want to prohibit functioning of the trigger instead of a lethal spray of bullets. Um, I don't know why Congress would want to do that, and I'm not sure what that really has to do with anything. Congress could presumably, if it were so inclined, define this by rate of fire, right? You shall not provide any mechanism that will allow the gun to fire at faster than blah, whatever rate of fire, I don't know. But Congress wrote function of the trigger. Justice Jackson over here is has gone way past text. Justice Jackson apparently over here is ready to completely abandon text. Text is an, is an annoyance because we don't need anything about the trigger. We can just talk about the 800 bullets. Also, not for nothing, where is she getting this number 800 bullets? Ah, okay. Moving on. Because the statute was written in 1934, about 100 years before we had bump stocks. So Congress drafted the statute at that time to capture the type of weaponry it wanted to prohibit in 1934. Your um, interpretation, Mr. Mitchell, though, you've said this several times in your brief, captures a fair number of weapons that nobody had on their radar screen in 1934. So let me ask you about that and where the line is. Sure. Um, if a gun... You know, not for nothing, but if Congress didn't have its on its radar in 1934, there's also the possibility that the statute doesn't cover it. I mean, old laws can certainly apply to new things. That concept isn't ludicrous. We apply the First Amendment to new things all the time. But there's also the distinct possibility that maybe, maybe, have you considered the possibility, have you ever considered the possibility that the statute doesn't cover it because Congress didn't conceive of it? Maybe, maybe the statute just doesn't have anything to do with this. Have you, have you considered that possibility? Eh. Eh. ...fires multiple shots at the push of a button or the flip of a switch uh, and just keeps firing. Yes, clearly that's a machine gun. That's a machine gun. Yes, that's United States against camp, essentially. Okay, and if a, if, if a gun does the same thing, except now it's the push of two buttons... So one button that fires, and then the other button that's necessary? Yes. Both buttons necessary? Yes. And neither by themselves sufficient? Yeah, I thought you say also on page 45 of your brief uh, that a, a, a push-operated machine gun that requires the shooter to push and hold two buttons, that that would also qualify. Right, because the two buttons together are acting as the trigger in that scenario. So okay. The trigger is the device that initiates the firing of the weapon. So if okay. you need to push two buttons and not just one, then both the two buttons combined are the trigger. Okay. So now, instead of doing two buttons, suppose you had one button, and with the... Uh, are these hypotheticals going anywhere? I mean, I, I kind of understood, how about, instead of a trigger, how about a button? I, I got that, but now we're talking about two buttons, and now we're talking... Are these hypotheticals going anywhere? I'm confused. The other hand, you held the trigger. One button that you're pushing, and then with the other hand, you're... Yeah, instead of two buttons, right. it's one button, and you held the trigger. And you need to do both to fire. You can't Same just do one. Same as you just had to do That's... two buttons, and mm -hmm. you conceded the two buttons is a machine gun. So now I'm saying instead of pushing two buttons, you push one button, and you hold the trigger. So like a rifle that also has a grip safety? Uh, okay, I, I guess. 
It's going to depend on what, how we define trigger. And that's, it's, the answer to that will not always be clear. The question is, can you extend the hold of the United States against camp to this particular situation? I mean, trigger, I have to say, yeah. I, I think you don't quite know what the answer to that is. If, if you have an answer, let me know. Because the difference between pushing... I mean, I haven't seen, I'm not, a, again, not an expert on fully automatic firearms, but I'm not sure that there's a fire, maybe there is, maybe there's a machine gun that, in addition to pulling the trigger, has something like a grip safety. Yeah, there probably is, somewhere. Yeah, I, I've never seen one, but you know, there's a lot of guns, who knows? And two buttons for me, and pushing one button and holding the trigger is not self-evident. To pushing a button and holding the trigger, and you need to do both. Say and both. It. Boy, I, th I thought I was being pretty clear here. Yeah. You push two buttons, you say it's a machine gun. Now you don't push two buttons. You have to push one button and hold the that trigger. That shouldn't make a difference. What the fuck are we talking about? They're both going to be considered. You either have to both be machine guns or neither. I don't think you can draw a distinction. Correct. I and you said much. the first is a machine gun, so the second has to be a machine gun. Okay, so mm -hmm. now I guess I want to know. What's the difference between pushing a button and holding the trigger and pushing the barrel and holding the trigger? You've just described a bump stock. No, no, because you don't need to push the barrel forward to fire the weapon. You can fire the weapon just by clicking the trigger every single time, like a normal semi-automatic weapon fires. But, but what the bump stock does, mm -hmm. oh, oh, you're saying you don't have to put pressure. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I, I have lost the plot completely. I mean, I'd like to think I'm reasonably educated on firearms. I've done a little bit of competition shooting with pistol. I have actually fired a machine gun before. I've actually loaded, I actually loaded the machine gun, you actually loaded the links, made the little links myself, which was very satisfying. And then, you know, you put them together with all the little links and then you, then you get rid of all your work in like 10 seconds, like dominoes or something, very satisfying. But I have no idea what she's talking about. So, I have to defer to the other God experts in the chat. What the hell is she talking about? Does anyone understand what she's talking about? Between the, gu between the guns with the trigger and the button and two buttons, what the hell is she talking about? Does anyone know? <laughs> well, it's neither necessary nor sufficient to fire the weapon. The trigger is the device that initiates the firing. Here's what I'm so. trying to say. You've, and I appreciate mm -hmm. uh, your, you know, going down this road of hypotheticals with me. But if, if pushing one button and holding a trigger is a machine gun, then mm -hmm. a device that works by pushing the barrel, the front of the gun, essentially, I don't know about these things. And oh, don't you now? Trigger, seems again to me to essentially do the same thing. It, and that is how everybody uses these devices. Like, I mean, maybe you could use the device differently, but the entire point of this device is that you exert forward pressure and you have your finger on the trigger and then a torrent of bullets shoots out. So I don't understand why it's any different, it is different. from pushing a button and holding the trigger, pushing the barrel and holding the trigger. The, the difference is you don't need to push the barrel to fire the weapon. In the other hypotheticals that Your Honor is describing, you need to push those buttons to make the weapon fire. So if the it's fact not that there is a conceivable possibility of using these bump stock devices in a way that does not take advantage of what these bump stock devices do and are able to do. Mm -hmm. The fact that there is that conceivable possibility is what you are resting your entire argument no. on. Our argument depends on what's the trigger. The trigger is the device that initiates the firing of the weapon. A bump stock does not change the trigger in any way. It does not alter the nature of the trigger. The other hypothetical devices that Your Honor is describing are changing the triggering device, either by requiring pushing two buttons rather than just one. Nothing in the bump stock changes the trigger. The trigger is still, in this situation, the curved metal lever, and the Solicitor General has never contested that point, neither has DOJ at any point in this litigation. Mr. There's, Mitchell, yeah, Mr. Mitchell this, kind of, this conversation is totally confusing me because I, I thought that your argument depended on what the trigger, that the function of the trigger was what the trigger does mechanically inside the weapon. And therefore, whether you have one trigger or two triggers or three triggers or ten buttons, it doesn't matter. It mat what matters is what 
the trigger or the triggers do inside the gun. A, I would think. Uh, a, a, an M6, back in the day when it was possible to fire the standard military issue rifles, M16 from the 1970s on automatic, my understanding is that the military doesn't even, you can't even do that anymore. All you can fire at most is a burst of three shots. But, uh, there are two buttons on, on the, on the old time M16. You have to flip the, well, there are three. You have to, you have to flip it over from semi-automatic to automatic. That's one button. And then the other button is the pulling of the trigger. But do I misunderstand your argument? No, you're not misunderstanding it at all. The function of the trigger is what the trigger does to cause the weapon to fire. That's what function of the trigger means. But to determine that, we need to first determine what exactly the trigger is before we can consider what is the function of the trigger. And there will be certain types of devices, like this motorized trigger device in United States against camp, where the trigger actually is changed because you're no longer pulling the curved metal lever to set off the weapon. Instead, you're flipping some switch that now, starts motor. Now I'm completely any, uh, lost. The trigger is not doing anything. It's the person doing something. And it's the person choosing on an M16 whether they're going to keep the switch on semi-automatic or put the switch on automatic and turn the M16 into a machine gun. And... On a machine gun, it's not the trigger that does this. It's the pressure that the shooter is using to hold the trigger down that permits it to keep going. That's what causes the trigger, trigger. to function. Well, but the, but, the, but the pause, that's what the government is saying, which is you're not looking at what the, what the trigger is doing. You're looking at what the shooter is doing, and is he using a force, keeping the gun down, keeping the trigger down or holding the bump stock and letting it shoot back and forth in an automatic recoil, those are not things that changes the automatic nature of the firing. It still has nothing to do with what the shooter does. The question is, what does the trigger do when it functions? And if the trigger allows more than one shot to fire per function of the trigger, what is the single function of the trigger? But and on a the, triggers, the, the trigger you're saying can be a button, so why can't it be the bump stock that's forcing this thing automatically in a recoil motion to go back and forth? Because the bump stock doesn't fire the weapon. The bump stock is just a case in which the weapon slides back and forth. That doesn't do anything to fire the weapon. The they have way- defined the bump stock as the trigger? No one defines the bump stock as the trigger. In this could case. they have? No, they could not, because the bump stock is neither necessary nor sufficient for the firing of the weapon. It's the curved metal lever on the semi-automatic rifle that causes the weapon to fire. Mr. That, yes, sorry. Mr. Mitchell, um, seems is it is it just me? Is it is it just me, or has the last five minutes or so just been complete confusion? Because several members of the Supreme Court don't understand how firearms work on even the most basic level. I, I'm not even 100% sure they, ans- they understand the question they're asking, let alone me. I say, what you got is a button, and a, you got a button and a trigger, and a button and a trigger and a switch. And, and, okay. Um, yeah. I'm not hundred and 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 this the poor the poor attorney the poor attorney is 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 one step away from from saying them down and be like okay guys you don't understand how firearms work on even the most basic level we gotta have we gotta have a we gotta have a we gotta have a discussion here because you you guys yeah <laughs> all right yeah all mm-hmm. right. To me, the spirit of some of the questions you're getting are in the nature of the any circumvention principle. Mm-hmm. That, okay, maybe in 1934, function of the trigger meant the firing, the, 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 the essential thing that causes the weapon to fire. Mm-hmm. But the high rate of fire that's achievable through bump stocks is effectively the equivalent, and we should take cognizance of that. Your thoughts? It's just not what the statute says. It has nothing to do with the rate of fire. But, but the statute doesn't say a lot of things that you've agreed are prohibited under the statute. The statute 
doesn't, you know, think about buttons and the statue oh doesn't God. think about switches. And I have to think that if I gave you a different hypo that said it was voice activated, mm-hmm. um, that you would have to say, yes, that's a machine gun, too. And the statue doesn't think about that. And I guess mm-hmm. what. But wouldn't all those things just be the trigger at that point? I mean. The. Okay. Justice Gorsuch is saying is that you, in arguing this case, have had to do something very sensible because otherwise it would seem, you know, like, you know, this statute is loaded with anti-circumvention devices. The entire way this statute is written Mm -hmm. suggests that Congress was very aware, aware that there could be uh, uh, small adjustments of a weapon that could get around what Congress meant to prohibit. And, and, and See, again, this is just more left-leaning legal thinking. And it, this is just what they meant to do, right? This is, again, going to, like, purpose. This is going to intent. This is going to policy. This is much more just left-line, left-line legal thinking. You know, the words on the page are less important than, yeah, it's the spirit, it's the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. So the spirit of the law is definitely the dominant thing in more left-leaning thinking versus the letter of the law, if you want to think about it that way. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, not surprising. Justice Kagan is, of course, on the left, although she's the most moderate person on the left, by far, and the Supreme Court, so... I actually respect her. I know this is, you know, but this is okay. Pressing on. And in all kinds of ways, you are accepting of that. You guys are talking about having Runkle sit through this? I I think Runkle might lose his shit. You, you You want Runkle to react to this thing? Do you guys not like Runkle? Maybe I should have, maybe I should just scrap this entire stream. Maybe I should just scrap this entire stream and pretend the whole thing never happened and schedule it for another time with Runkle. And we can all pretend together that I've never heard or seen any of this stuff. And we can just, we can just pretend it's the first time. That could be good. And saying, yes, you can't circumvent it by that. You can't circumvent it by non-conventional triggers. You can't circumvent it by, you know, all these things that uh, these hypotheticals I've been giving you. But you can circumvent it through this one mechanism. I'm not conceding that you can circumvent the statute, Justice Kagan. We're just interpreting the word trigger, which is a term that appears in the statutory text, and it has to be interpreted. When you're dealing with the motorized trigger device, that's an easy case in one direction, because that has changed the trigger from the curved metal lever, because the shooter is no longer using that to fire the weapon. Instead, there's a switch that is flipped, and that switch is now triggering the device, because that is the function, turning on the switch, that then causes automatic fire to occur because there's some motor that's moving the trigger back. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the trigger, the curved metal lever back and forth. That's the United States against camp. This is an easy case because the bump stock doesn't change the trigger in any way. But what do you, Everyone, do, what do, you do about modification pieces? Um, I guess I don't understand your argument insofar as I had taken the United States to always take the position, and I actually had a case about this when I was a district court mm-hmm. judge, where the question was, were these flat metal pieces that were mailed internationally to the defendant machine guns? And we were all confused. The jury was confused because we had this notion of what a machine gun was. And the government argued that this metal piece was a machine gun and brought in experts that said under this statute, anything that can be used to convert a regularly operating semi-automatic weapon into one that rapid fires qualifies. I'm sorry, Justice Jackson. That's rapid, wrong? Rapid fire is not the test under the statute. The, it, it's not whether it fires rapidly. It's whether it fires more than one shot okay, automatically by I'm a simple sorry. function of the trigger. I'm sorry. Okay. They said it could, but what we focused on was not whether that metal piece changed the way the trigger operated. Now, maybe you're saying that's wrong, but I guess what I'm focused on is mm-hmm. that y- your argument seems to rest on the assumption 
that the function of the trigger, as Justice Alito says, is what the trigger does inside the gun. That's correct. Why is it irrational, wrong, et cetera, to think of the function of the trigger is, as what it does to cause the weapon to automatically fire more than one shot? If that's what we mean by function of the trigger, which is in the statute, automatically more than one shot, and what we're saying is by if, if one operation causes the trigger to um, the function causes the function of the trigger to make the weapon automatically fire more than one shot. I guess I don't understand why your reading is preferable to that when 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 the common understanding of a machine gun is that it is doing this sort of thing at the end of the day. Well, it's because the trigger on a bump stock equipped rifle does not cause the rifle to automatically fire more than one shot. You still have to have manual action by the shooter in response to every single shot that gets fired. The shooter has to continue to thrust that four stock forward. Okay, and if that's hand. true, that's true. It that, is true. That is, yes. Okay, that is a distinction. My other question then comes in. Why is that distinction matter from Congress's perspective in terms of it writing a statute that it was trying to prohibit that? If you're right that that's the relevant distinction, I guess I need a reason why there's something inherently so much worse about a situation in which you push it forward rather than pull it back that 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 we can reasonably say that that was a, a particular category that Congress wanted to prohibit. And that's what I'm missing in well, your argument. Because, it doesn't make yeah. sense to me that we're going to identify guns on that purpose and say those are the ones that prohibit that are prohibited when others that achieve the same result are not. It's because the statute was written in 1934, and Congress wasn't thinking about bump stocks when they wrote this statute. Counsel, so you've said um, several times uh, that you thrust uh, with your non-trigger hand, it, it thrust the part of the gun forward. Right. And I understood your friend on the other side to focus on it more as maintaining pressure. Right. Um, which, which is it? I mean, do you hold it? And you have to hold it harder at certain points rather than others, or are you actually moving it with the thrusting? You're definitely moving your hand back and forth, and Mr. Fletcher agreed with us on that point. The hand is moving. I think where our disagreement comes in is that Mr. Fletcher seems to characterize the action of the non-shooting hand, so the left hand for a right-handed shooter, as something where you are applying constant pressure in a certain direction, but the recoil is strong enough to overcome that pressure from the non-shooting hand and thereby move the weapon backward despite the forward pressure that's coming from the non-shooting hand. But that means there are, if, a, if a, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but that means that the way a shooter perceives it is by imposing constant forward pressure, not the shooter is thinking, I got to do this really fast, you know, the, going back and forth. The shooter can do both. And it, it takes a lot of practice to master the art of bump firing. So there is always going to be recoil energy. And no person, I think, is strong enough to push forward in a way that overcomes the recoil energy. If they were, bump firing wouldn't happen. So for successful bump firing to occur, there needs to be that back and forth motion. There's recoil every time the rifle fires. There's still pressure from the left hand or the right hand if you're a left-handed shooter. There's still going to be pressure from that non-shooting hand. But the shooter can decide how much he wants to calibrate that pressure in response to the repeated recoils that he's getting from the bump firing. It doesn't have to be the same amount of pressure each time. The shooter just has to make sure that the hand is moving back and forth, because that's the only way you can have successful bump firing. But to get back to your question, Mr. Chief Justice— but The shooter I, doesn't make sure that the hand is moving back and forth. That's the way the recoil operates. The shooter just makes sure that he's pushing forward, and then the recoil— recoil operates to, in fact, even though the shooter is not experiencing this, mm -hmm. um, is, is not uh, volitionally experiencing this, the shooter is not moving his hand back and forward. That's probably right, unless the shooter is so strong that he has to ease off a little bit to make sure he doesn't overcome the recoil. But to my knowledge, I don't think there's anybody strong enough to make to actually be able to keep pushing and forcing it past the recoil energy. But, Mr. Chief Justice, I don't think the answer to this question matters in the end, because even if we accept Mr. Fletcher's characterization, where it's just constant pressure with the same amount of force continuously over a sustained period of time, it's still a manual action. There's nothing automatic about that. The shooter is the one who is pushing. It's human effort, human exertion, nothing automatic at all about this process. And Mr. Fletcher said during his remarks that the bump stock harnesses the recoil energy of the weapon, that is false. With the Aikens accelerator, there is harnessing, because the Aikens accelerator has a spring. 
So there will be certain types of bump firing devices like the Aikens accelerator where you can accurately say that the bump stock harnesses the recoil energy of the weapon. Not so with respect to a non-mechanical bump stock. The weapon recoils, nothing is harnessed with respect to the recoil energy, and it is the shooter who must, with that non-shooting hand, continue to thrust the weapon forward in response. I disagree with you about automatically. Can you win solely on function of a trigger? Absolutely, yes. Why? Because the single function of the trigger, the Solicitor General has to win on both arguments to prevail. We only need to win on one of the two. So we could win on automatically standing alone. We could win on single function of the trigger standing alone. Or we could win on both. We respectfully ask the court to rule on both because there's a well-developed circuit split on each of the two sub-issues within the question. Well, presented. speaking of automatically, can you address the question I asked um, Mr. Fletcher about a banned bump firing? And, you know, he said it was different on the ground of automatically, but how do you see them functioning differently? They're indistinguishable when it comes to automatically. Everything involved with the ban that you, Your Honor, suggested and also everything involved with Mr. Cargill's non-mechanical bump stock is a manual action undertaken in entirely by the shooter. There is no automating device. Mr. Fletcher has yet to identify any device in the non-mechanical bump stock that automates any task that is necessary for successful bump firing. It is all being done by the shooter. There's the recoil after the shot gets fired, and that it is the shooter who must, with his own hand and with his own force, exert pressure forward consistently to make sure that the trigger bumps into his finger. This is all manual. Nothing automatic about it. Nothing at all. Can and I ask you a variation of the hypothetical black box scenario that the government puts forward in there? And you might be familiar with it. It's on. Yeah. It's in their brief. Um, so they say that we've got two boxes, each of which continuously fires bullets after the operator pr presses and releases a button. Um, if I hear you correctly, or maybe you can just tell me, right. it, uh, box one, the operator pushes the button and the bullets come out automatically. Box two, the operator holds his finger slightly above the box, and there's something, you know, under the box that pushes the box up into his finger. So the finger is touching the trigger like a million times because the bo in order for it to operate, the box is going like so, yeah. pushing up. One is machine gun, one is not. Same rate of yeah. velocity of bullets coming out. That's your view. The, the answer to that question depends on what is the trigger. Okay. And can the holding of the United States against camp? that Fifth Circuit decision that said motorized trigger devices are machine guns. Yeah. Can the rationale of that case be extended to this hypothetical? So I think the way to think of this, Your Honor, is there are going to be easy cases at each of the extremes, and there are going to be harder cases in the middle. The easy case is United States against camp, because that is a situation where the trigger was changed. It no longer is the curved metal lever. Right, it's right, right. To switch. But I guess, Everyone agrees and, with and that. Your, and your view is, is what makes it easy or hard is not the sort of thought of mine that, like, geez, what makes it easier or hard is actually distinguishing those two in the real world, like in terms of what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. You think what makes it easier or hard is just identifying whether the finger is mo is moving um, because the box is moving or because the person is pushing it down. What makes it hard is whether it's changed the nature of the trigger in some way. I mean, he, he keeps coming back to the same point, and I feel, I feel for him. Because this is all about functioning of the trigger, right? So he wins on automatically. So you got two parts of the statute that you're talking about, right? Because we, we looked at the statute before, right? We talked about this. We can talk about it again, right? So we got automatically more than one shot. That's one part of the language. And then single function of the trigger. Those are the two parts of this that we're debating. Is it automatic? Is it more than one function of the trigger? And he just keeps having to push them back and back and back over again about the nature of the trigger, because this all comes down to the trigger, right? I mean, the word is trigger in the statute. It literally says trigger, the function of the trigger. And he's like, so what makes this difficult is if you change, if you change the trigger because the statute talks about a trigger. So if you change the trigger, then, you know, you've changed the trigger. But if you haven't changed the trigger, that's the same trigger. And it feels, it feels like they just keep asking him questions that defy the basic definition of what we're talking about. And it's like, okay, guys, you do understand we're talking about the trigger. He's, he's, he's one step away 
from having to gunsplain this with, you know, dolls and, and, and dioramas or something. Because, guys, we're talking about the trigger. And you keep asking me questions. I'm like, you understand we're talking about the trigger. If it, it's it's not going great over here. Um, it feels, it feels. I, I mean, you know, I I have to I have to I have to say, it just feels. And maybe maybe I'm the only one who feels this way. It just feels like Justice Jackson, maybe doesn't have the greatest familiarity with firearms on the Supreme Court. Clearly that happened in camp. This situation with Mr. Cargill, there's not even an argument that the trigger has been changed. Neither DOJ at no point in this litigation has argued that bump stocks change the nature of the trigger or change the trigger at all. There will be harder cases in the middle, such as the forced reset triggers and some of these hypotheticals that were discussed in the D.C. Circuit's opinions in Gwetti's, where there may be a question as to what exactly the trigger is and then how does that trigger function. So, again, going back to camp, when there's a flip of a switch that turns on a motor, and that motor then forces the curved metal lever back and forth, that's automatic fire. That's a machine gun, because we now have a new trigger, the switch. It's no longer the curved metal lever. So can that rationale be extended to some of these hypotheticals, where we talk about black boxes and oscillating buttons? What exactly is the trigger there? Is it merely the button? Is it the motor that's moving the button up and down? It's arguable either way. We don't think the court should resolve any of that. I understand. But for us to take a position on the question, it's all going to depend on whether you can extend the holding of camp to these new situations. The Aikens accelerator is a good example to think about, because in 2006, when ATF changed its position on the Aikens accelerator, ATF initially approved that device in 2002. 2006, it changed its mind. And if you look at the classification letter, their argument rests on an argument similar to what Mr. Fletcher is making today. They cite the legislative history from Carl Frederick and say that function of the trigger means pull of the trigger. That rationale is not going to work if the Aikens accelerator is going to be characterized as a machine gun. What might work, though, is if there's some possible argument to extend the holding of the United States against camp to the Aikens accelerator. Does that spring in the Aikens accelerator change the nature of the trigger? That's the question that needs to be addressed. If ATF wants to continue to characterize the Aikens accelerator as a machine gun, it's going to need to come up with a much better argument than what it offered in 2006. We're not closing the door on that possibility. But we do think the actual rationale that ATF has used is just as faulty as the rationale for banning non-mechanical bump stocks. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Thomas? Uh, Mr. Mitchell, the, um, I think we, you would agree that um, uh, the bump stock in, uh, accelerates the rate of fire. Absolutely. Um, why wouldn't you then take the further step of saying it changes the nature of the trigger in okay. doing that? Because the trigger still has to reset after every single shot. It's not accelerating the rate of fire by changing the trigger. It's accelerating the rate of fire. That's not really what I'm I'm sorry. So the why wouldn't you say that you have enhanced the triggering mechanism um, by using the bump stock? Because it's not changing the triggering mechanism at all. It's simply making it easier for the shooter to bump that trigger repeatedly. The nature of the triggering mechanism remains exactly the same. What's going on inside the gun after the trigger gets bumped is no different than what it would be if it were a semi-automatic rifle without the bump stock. And that's why the government can't win on this single function of the trigger point. I think, I think the difference is that there may be some who believe, when you look at it, the, the nature of the firing has changed as a result of the bump stock. So if that's changed, why don't you simply then look backwards and say that the nature of the firing mechanism has changed, thus the nature of the trigger has changed? What's changed, though, is the rate of fire, and it's still one shot mm -hmm. per function of the trigger. Even though those shots are coming out of the barrel a lot faster than they were before, the question is, how many functions of the trigger do we have for each of the shots? And the answer is one. If you divide the number of shots that are fired from a bump stock equipped rifle by the number of times the trigger has to function to produce that shot, the answer will always be. Uh, yeah, gone coastal forces. Can we start attacking the NFA instead of playing patty cake with these pretty inane arguments? Yeah, okay. Uh, I want you to think about your own question for a second. Given how difficult 
the Supreme Court, especially some members of the Supreme Court, seem to be having with the idea that maybe this doesn't cover this thing. Do you really think the Supreme Court is ready to start revisiting the idea of whether the NFA or the Gun Control Act of 1984 is, is constitutional in, in some sort of major way? Uh, the Supreme Court's simply not ready for any of that. The case law simply does not, there's simply not enough predicate case law to even begin thinking about a dream of that. You're off in la-la land, my friend. We're, we, have to, we have to work small before we can even think about these big steps. You're out of your mind. ...and will remain that way because nothing in the triggering mechanism has changed. Justice Alito? Can you imagine a legislator thinking we should ban machine guns, but we should not ban bump stocks? Is there any reason why a legislator might reach that judgment? I think there is. Bump stocks can help people who have disabilities, who have problems with finger dexterity, people who have arthritis in their fingers. There could be a valid reason for preserving the legality of these devices as a matter of policy, even while similar weapons such as the fully- I remember this. I remember this when there was DC versus Heller and Alan Gura offered, uh, um, argued um, DC versus Heller. And I've met Alan Gura a couple times. And as well as I met Heller, I met, I met Mr. Heller as well. And I met Mr. McDonald before he died. Um, so I, I met these people, which was kind of cool. And anyway, I remember Alan Gura was giving a talk. At, I think it was, I can't remember if the Supreme Court had decided Heller yet or not. It, it had been argued, but I don't remember if it had been decided yet. Alan Gura was giving a talk to the Virginia Citizens Defense League, an organization I was a member of and an executive member of and a legal advisor to for a number of years. Virginia Citizens Defense League is arguably the most effective pro-gun group in Virginia. And he was giving a talk to a room full of people who are VCDL, so they're all pro-gun people. And some people were actually asking him questions like, hey, why didn't you, they literally were asking him, why didn't you go to the Supreme Court and talk about machine guns? Why didn't you talk about trying to get machine gun bans undone? And I'm thinking to myself, you're all idiots. <laughs> this, it, must, it must have been after it was decided. It must have been after it was decided because I remember thinking to myself when they were saying that, this was 5-4, guys. This was 5-4. You really want Alan Gura to go in there and start talking about how the constitutionality of machine guns when we're trying to get the idea of maybe people could help, maybe people could own a pistol in their home maybe? And you want Alan Gura to go in there and talk about machine guns? How well do you expect that argument to go? And people were asking this question, and I'm like, you're all idiots. You're all fucking morons. Automatic machine guns are being banned. Whether Congress would ultimately make that judgment, we would have to wait and find out whether they would decide it along those ways. But there are respectable arguments for why these could remain legal as a matter of policy. Why would anybody? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, in the field of statutory interpretation, Justice Scalia's Benton Noir was the Church of the Holy Trinity, a case where he thought that uh, the literal language of the statute uh, had to control, even though it's pretty hard to think that Congress actually meant that to apply in certain situations. As you see this case, is this another? Church of the Holy Trinity case? I would say it's quite as egregious as Church of the Holy Trinity, but the arguments the government's making are certainly in the spirit of Holy Trinity, the borrow phrase that was used from the Holy Trinity opinion. And I don't think a textualist judge can accept the rationale that's being offered by the U.S. government. And they are, in their brief, especially making purposeful arguments along the lines of what we saw in Church of the Holy Trinity. Thank you. Justice Sotomayor? Why would even a person with arthritis, why would Congress think they needed to shoot 400 to seven or 800 rounds of ammunition under any circumstance? You, you can't shoot. If you don't let a person without arthritis do that, 
why would you permit a person with arthritis to do it? Well, they don't shoot 400 or 700 rounds because the magazine only goes up to 50. So you're still going to have to change the magazine after every round. We allow large capacity magazines up to 50. And also, there are many shooters who can pull the trigger of a semi-automatic rifle very quickly, who can accomplish rates of fire similar to those that approach fully automatic weapons. So I don't... Counsel, um, you spoke about um, legislative history, and Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm... I think you're trying to bat away all of the statements uh, during the legislative process that called um, the functions of the trigger, the uh, single pull of the trigger by the shooter. That's right. Um, but it's not classic legislative history. It's how people understood a term at the time. That's not legislative history. Well, it's still legislative history. They're just using it for a purpose that they Well, claim. Justice Thomas said in McDonald versus City of Chicago, that it's perfectly acceptable to do that, to use, he said, um, if it's being cited to show what lawmakers, uh, how lawmakers used a particular term, that's different than what they intended. So if we're using legislative history in an effort to discern the original public meaning of the statute, which is how I understand Your Honor's exactly. characterization, and I think that's how Mr. Fletcher is trying to characterize his reliance on this statement from Mr. Frederick, which, it's not just which that. is the statement we've got of the lobbyists. Statements. We've got statements in the House we've got mm-hmm. from legislators in the House. We have statements from legislators in the Senate, all of them consistently translating a function of the trigger to me, a single pull of the trigger. Right, and they're all wrong because the statute also was written to encompass weapons Respect. that have push triggers Respect. rather than pull triggers. And the Solicitor General acknowledges this point in her opening well, that, brief. So, what it suggests to me is that, contrary to what you're saying, it is they never understood this to be uh, how the trigger functions, but how the shooter functions. No, I think we should draw the exact opposite inference. It proves how unreliable legislative history is as a tool to try to discern what We're the statute means. We're going to disagree. Well, it's because, Justice Sotomayor, the phrase pull of the trigger can't be equated with function of the trigger. And even the Solicitor General acknowledges that because they say in their brief that the statute needs to be read in a way that encompasses fully automatic weapons that have push triggers rather than triggers that are pulled. And you so agree. the word function, I'm sorry. And, and you agree? I agree that function but can't be equated with the word pull. the only way you get pull. there is by looking at what the shooter is doing. No, that's okay, not correct. That's you don't need to look at what the shooter's doing. A weapon can go off by accident. You don't need a shooter. There's still a function of the trigger. If the weapon falls onto the floor and goes off accidentally with a discharge, the trigger has functioned, even though the shooter hasn't pulled the trigger or pushed it or bumped it. What matters under this statute is what the trigger does. And all these examples that we see in the Solicitor General's brief, Justice Gorsuch mentioned this earlier, when they're taking transitive verbs, when they say swing of the bat or stroke of the key or roll of the dice, all of those are transitive verbs that are capable of taking an object. So when you see swing of the bat, there's obviously an unnamed actor in that sentence that is the subject of the verb swing. The bat can't swing itself. The bat's an inanimate object. Function of the trigger is entirely different. Function is an intransitive verb. It can't take an object grammatically. It's impossible. Trigger has to be the subject of function. It Thank can't you, be the counsel. object. I'm sorry. Justice Kagan? Because, Mr. Mitchell, I mean... I mean, this guy is definitely trying to school them as best as he can. I respect him. I respect him standing up for his position. He's handling it very well, perhaps slightly aggressively. I'm not sure there's necessarily a better way to do it, but he, he's being... a. Li- He's being perhaps a bit antagonistic and uh, something on his tone, maybe, or his delivery. Maybe it's just a touch too antagonistic. So maybe maybe it's a word choice issue. Maybe he could soften it a little. But I appreciate him standing up for himself, and I appreciate him being frustrated because he feels like he has to constantly teach what are fairly rudimentary concepts, and he has to say it over and over again because they're not getting it. But he's handling himself well. He's not getting flustered. He's not losing his temper. He's perhaps slightly more aggressive or slightly sharper than is ideal. But he's a very good advocate, and he's doing a very good job of sticking to his frame and advocating his frame despite hostility from members and just trying to show what he thinks is true. So I appreciate this guy. He's doing a very good job in his position. So... Yeah, and he's he's even trying to use softer word choice. Like one of you guys got 
mad at him for using the word allow. Again, I think you're being a little harsh on that point uh, with respect. Again, this is, you have to sort of remember the state of Second Amendment law. It's not great right now. So, and he knows that he has a bit of an uphill battle. If this isn't 5-4, I would, if this is 5-4, I wouldn't be surprised. And he very well might lose this argument. He very well might lose this argument. So he's trying to, he's not trying to oversell more than he needs to. He just needs to win this case. And for that matter, the Second Amendment people in the room also just need to win the case. What you guys, what the Second Amendment needs, what you guys, what we just need is just a bunch of wins. We just need a bunch of small wins. They don't have to be big. They just have to be a small wins. And that's how you, that's how you build case law. And that's how you build momentum. And that's how you build a direction. You don't need, you don't need to do everything at once. I understand some of you guys are frustrated because you think the Gun Control Act or the NFA is illegal or unconstitutional in, sub, in substantial parts. Incidentally, I haven't done a deep enough dive to even know if I agree with you. But even assuming the predicate, even assuming that it is largely unconstitutional, the, the, you, we just need to do this in small pieces. You, know, you need to take this one step at a time and build up a, build up a foundation of case law before you can even dream of do you know just you you, you want to make it easier for the supreme court to rule for you than than not you want them to start taking second amendment cases you want them to start ruling for you you got to make it easy for them you got to make it easy for them so that 10 years from now 20 years from now someone can use that foundation and start you know making a little bit more aggressive steps i think he's doing a fine job so i i like him Yeah, just want another rational win. That's right. Yeah, you just want another. You're, you, it, you might be, it might be 100 years of getting screwed, but that's 100 years of precedent. I mean, not maybe not legal precedent because, again, the Second Amendment ha hasn't had a lot of love on it either way, although in circuit courts it did, with, mostly with the just saying the Second Amendment doesn't exist as a practical matter. So, yeah, you're trying to overcome 100 years' worth of momentum. You know, you're going to have to take this you don't have to take this one step at a time. Yeah. You email me these house hearings from 34 NFA. I have no particular interest in reading them. You can email me, them, email me to them, but I'll ignore it. I have no particular interest in reading the hearings. It's not particularly relevant to what I'm trying to decide. So, thanks anyway. Those four words are not the entire statute, you know, function of the trigger. Um, it's by a function of the trigger, and what's the by? It's shooting, you know, presumably a shooter is there, but, you know, maybe it happens spontaneously, but shooting more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. I mean, that's the relevant language, right? Shooting more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. And then there's also the automatic. Automatic, yeah. So right. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, ignore that. But it, it seems as if you look at the entire phrase, um, what that means is that Congress had um, uh, wanted to de-link the number of shots that were coming out of a barrel, right, more than one shot, mm -hmm. and wanted to de-link that from a discrete human action. And I would think, you know, it might be you pull the trigger, it might be you push the trigger, it might be you switch on the trigger, it might be right. you voice activate the trigger. Um, um, uh, there's a discrete human action, and it produces a torrent of um, uh, bullets. And that's exactly what's happening here. You push the bump stock. Now, you're, you're saying, well, maybe they didn't define the bump stock as the trigger, but, but it, it functions in precisely the same way. And a torrent of bullets comes out, and this is in the heartland of what they were concerned about, which is anything that takes just a little human action to produce more than one shot is what they were getting at. That's just not the way they wrote the statute. If that's what they were getting at, they should have drafted the statute Shoot. better than what they did. And it depends on whether more than one shot is coming out by a single function of the trigger. And I agree with Your Honor. There are, the rate of fire of a bump stock equipped rifle 
approaches the rate of fire of a fully automatic weapon. And there may be good policy reasons to treat these as identical. There may also be good policy reasons to distinguish them. That's ultimately a decision for Congress to make. It's certainly not a decision for a court or for an administrative agency that's charged with implementing the instructions of Congress. Mr. Mitchell, I'll tell you, I view myself as a good textualist. I think that that's the way we should think about statutes. It's by reading them. But, you know, textualism is not inconsistent with common sense. Like, at some point, you have to apply a little bit of common sense to the way you read a statute and understand that what this statute comprehends is a weapon that fires a multitude of shots with a single human action, whether it's a continuous pressure on a a conventional machine gun holding the trigger or a continuous pressure on um, one of these devices on the barrel. I, I can't understand how anybody could think that those two things should be treated differently. Well, they're treated differently because the statute turns on a single function of the trigger. And the problem for the government is they're not able to change the nature of the trigger that currently exists on a semi-automatic rifle simply by adding a bump stock, which is nothing more than a casing that allows the rifle to slide back and forth. The trigger is exactly the same as what it was before, and the function of the trigger is exactly the same as what it was before. I mean, think of a semi-automatic rifle where someone just has a very quick trigger finger. That could also have a very, very high rate of fire, but it's still one shot per function of the trigger. And that's the problem here the government still is not able to overcome. Every time that trigger functions inside a bump stock equipped rifle, there is one shot and only one shot that gets fired, even though there may be rapid functions that occur consecutively because of the bump stock equipped. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Gorsuch. Justice Kavanaugh. In response to a lot of the questions, you've made the point that bump stocks were not around as of 1934. Mm -hmm. And that's a a good point uh, for you. But what evidence is there, if any, that as of 1934, the ordinary understanding of the phrase function of the trigger referred to the mechanics of the gun rather than the the shooter's motion? Well, it had to. And the evidence that we can see is the evidence the Solicitor General points out about the fact that there were push triggers in existence at that time. And that function of the trigger, even though you can find legislative history where there seem to be people who think function of the trigger means the same thing as pull of the trigger, those phrases cannot be equated for that very reason. I guess I'm asking the opposite. Was there any evidence that someone was drawing that distinction? Drawing the distinction between push and pull? No, the distinction between that function of the trigger meant something different. I'm not aware of that in legislative history. Are you aware of that anywhere in kind of communication at the time? Not at the time, no, because the communication, as we can see from the record, was rather sloppy. People were using pull of the trigger as a phrase that they thought was synonymous with function of the trigger. And that guess, obviously is not the case. Okay, so, so no one that was saying, oh, function of the trigger, that's a different phrase than pull or push, and therefore it means something different. Are you aware of anyone who said that anywhere no, but in America as, at the time? I'm not aware of that, but as a textualist, I don't find that concerning because— well, if you, uh, as a textualist, um, you have to think about the phrase, not just each word in the phrase. That's, That's right. That's right. And when we look at the yeah. phrase function of the trigger, as I was saying earlier, and Justice Gorsuch made this point in some of his earlier questioning, yeah. function of the trigger. I mean, yeah. trigger is, we talked about this before, trigger has to be the subject of function, can't be the object. Or right. And now, so the follow-on question is just focus on the phrase, and I'm just making the point, I don't think anyone said this at the time, which right. just doesn't defeat your argument. I'm not suggesting it defeats your argument, right. but it would obviously help your argument if people were drawing that distinction. It, it, it certainly would help, but the phrase, given the way it's written right now, and the impossibility textually of trying to make trigger into an object of the verb okay, And then no one was drawing the distinction. Why would Congress have drawn that distinction? Your big point, I think, we've got to look at 1934. We've got to look at what Congress wrote. Why would Congress have drawn that distinction in 1934? Because they wanted to get the fully automatic weapons that had the push triggers. And if you use pull of the trigger, you're not going to reach those devices. So they had to say function of the trigger to make sure we encompass those forms of weaponry, as well as the conventional fully automatic cover weaponry. push and pull. Push and pull, exactly. And how should it be defined now, in your view, you may have just answered this, sure. to cover bump stocks? In other words, oh. uh, tomorrow Congress said, Mr. Mitchell, how should we write the statute to cover bump stocks since function of the trigger, in your view, doesn't do it? Well, I'd have to ask them what else do you want to encompass besides bump stocks. If they want to make it's it specific. Just bump stocks. Well, it, then I would, you, uh, give me a sentence that you think would cover bump stocks. <laughs> 
I would provide a statutory definition of bump stock that tracks as closely as possible the non-mechanical devices that Mr. Cargill has. And uh, I certainly wouldn't say single function. Great trigger. statutory language. Yeah. You got anything better than that? <laughs> I think you could say any device, and this may be a little too broad, but you could say any device that is used to accelerate the rate of fire from a semi-automatic weapon. That would probably capture, that would certainly capture bump stocks. It might capture some other things, but those other things would be similar enough to bump stocks that Congress would probably want to ban them as well. Which, they, yeah, back in the 30s, some of the state statutes did that, I guess, yeah. at the time. Um, okay. Last yeah. question. You haven't made a um, Second Amendment or constitutional avoidance argument. In your view, are bump stocks covered by the Second Amendment, protected by the Second Amendment? But we didn't argue that because courts are generally loath to decide constitutional questions when there's an easy statutory offering. You didn't throw it in as constitutional avoidance, and I imagine that was a considered choice, and I'm curious what, what was behind that. There, there's nothing that prevents this court from invoking the constitutional avoidance canon on the Second Amendment issue, because there is a question, at least, whether this falls within the dangerous and unusual weapons carve-out in Heller. We don't have a position on that question, because we didn't brief it, and also dangerous and unusual weapons is vague enough that it's just not clear to us what the answer would be. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Barrett. Justice Jackson. So I guess I'm still not clear as to why you believe there's only one meaning of function of the trigger in this context. Um, so w why couldn't we read the words function of the trigger in this statute to mean um, the function of the trigger is to start a chemical reaction that leads to the exp expulsion of a projectile? If I read function of the trigger in that way, um, I think I come out to a different result than you are positing. So help me to understand why that couldn't be the function of the trigger. You, in other words, I know, I'm sorry, okay. confusing sorry. question. Yeah. Um, you seem to be saying that the function of the trigger and the only one that Congress cared about that matters for the way this statute reads right. is the movement of the trigger. No, no not no. necessarily the movement. Okay, it, tell me. It's, it's what the trigger does yes. to I'm sorry. cause the weapon to fire. Okay, what That's the trigger does. Um, and it's and more I than guess just the movement. I'm saying what the trigger does, both in this case, in a bump stock case, and in a machine gun case, is to start a chemical reaction that leads to the expulsion of a projectile. There, there are other so, devices in the firearm that actually do that part. What the trigger does, it releases. No, the no, no, no. But it's 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 like it's like causation, right? It's like it's like Mrs. Paul's graph standing on the scale. I mean, sure. the trigger, <laughs> the trigger. Um, you know, the function of it, right, one could say, is to start this chemical reaction. Now, some weapons might do it with a button. Some might do it with a pull. Yeah. Some weapons might do it by moving back and forth quickly, by the mechanics of the gun operating in a certain way. Others might do it by the mechanics of the gun operating in a different way. But I could say that the function is to begin the chem chemical reaction that results in the expulsion of this weapon, and that happens both in the bump stop stock situation and in this situation. So I don't understand why this statute couldn't be read as the, the way that the government is. Even if even if you read the statute that way, Your Honor, I don't see how that wins the case for the government. Why That's not? Because only one shot is being fired per function of the trigger. So no, single, single function. Yes. Right. If I read the single, the, yeah. there's only a single thing happens right. to begin the chemical reaction that expels the bullet. That expels right. one bullet, one shot. But then we go into the other part of the statute, automatically multiple shots. You can't forget the rest of the statute. That was Justice Kagan's point. So, so when we put not. those together, the work of the function of the trigger, I think, could be to start the chemical reaction that then results in the automatic sh uh, mo more than one shot coming out of the gun. Why can't I if, interpret if it that way? If that's what actually were happening, then I think you would have a plausible argument for why this is a machine. But that's just, that's just not what happens. That's not the way but, it works. But that's just but, because you're interpreting the statute to say you have to, it has to be about the mechanics. No. And what I'm trying to understand is how that's consistent with Congress putting modifications in here. I'm just saying that, a, right, can I, can I, can I just change the a little bit? Mm -hmm. If you're right that Congress cared about exactly the mechanistic operation, then I'm confused as to why this statute also talks about modifications, because that suggests that Congress was not hung up 
on exactly how this gun operates. We're, we're sweeping in all kinds of things, things that originally was, weren't designed to work this way at all, right? We're, we're, we're allowing for machine guns to include things that can modify something that didn't operate this way at all into a machine, into the kind of thing where a chemical reaction kicks it off and it automatically fires more than one shot. If that's what I'm thinking about, then I guess I don't understand your hang up over how this operates mechanistically. Well, the test under the statute is whether it can be readily restored to fire automatically more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. It's not whether it can be modified to fire automatically more than one function of the trigger. All right. Well, I'll look that up. Yeah. And and, and just to get back to your earlier question, Mm -hmm. Justice Jackson. Yes. It's factually incorrect to say that a function of the trigger automatically starts some chain reaction that propels multiple bullets from the gun. A function of the trigger fires one shot. Then the shooter must take additional manual action. I I understand. That's your argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. A rebuttal, Mr. Fletcher? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Well, I mean, I think he did as well as he could, honestly, within the constraints that he had. And by the way, this gives you guys a chance to look at the background while I'm talking here. Of course, the problem I'm trying to solve is keeping the stuff in the background well visible ideally i'd like you to be able to like read the small text on the you know diplomas and stuff like that but you know whatever so i currently have it at f-stop 11 to make sure that you know the background doesn't get too fuzzy and then i had to uh jump so the more i the bigger the f number the more i had to jump up the iso so this is iso at 8000 so is it too noisy on the visual you guys can let me know In any case, while you guys are typing that out, as to the substance of what's going on, the court, I think he did as well. I think he did a good job. He, he, I think he defended his ground as well as he could. He definitely has an issue and he wants to make sure that they understand the issue and he wants to put them into the box that he understands this in because it's the issue he's, it's the issues he's highlighted. I don't think he's wrong to go about this way. It's, it's something that really makes things good. Um, so I think I think it's a winnable it's a winnable frame. I don't think he could be any more aggressive in his frame. I think he's already struggling for the votes he needs to be quite honest. So I don't think he could have picked a more aggressive frame. And the fact that this bump stock doesn't have any mechanical components in it like a spring or anything like that definitely helps a lot as well. I think. And then just trying to talk to them about, you know, well what matters is the trigger. And then you had questions from Justice Jackson in particular, who's ready to give up the statutory text in order to go to the purpose and the spirit of the law. So Justice Sotomayor is obviously in dissent. Justice Jackson's obviously in dissent. Justice Kagan is likely in dissent. Amy Coney Barrett might be in dissent. And who knows where Chief Justice Roberts is going to be. So I don't even think you can be assured of five votes here. But I think he did as well as he could within the framework that he had. So, we'll see. All right. I'm guessing since you guys have not been yelling at me in the chat that there's not too much problems. Does any of you guys have me up on like a big screen TV? That is there is there too much noise in the video? Can you see? Is there too much like? Does it look okay or is it fu- how's it look? So you guys can let me know. And by the way, just a friendly reminder to subscribe to me on Twitch. Only 27 of you currently subscribe. Something to something to solve. We've got another four minutes of this oral argument, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. It looks great. Fantastic. So I take from my friend's answers today that he does not seriously dispute that a rifle with a bump stock does basically the same thing as a machine gun and is basically just as dangerous as a machine gun. But his argument is the words that Congress wrote in 1934 just don't cover it because the word single function of a trigger unambiguously refers to the movement or the mechanics of the trigger without regard to the action of the shooter. We are not making a holy trinity argument. If that is what the words meant, then we would be stuck with the words. We are not asking you to depart from the plain language. We're asking you to give it its natural reading. And I think it, to understand why the, the statute not only can be, but should be read our way, it's worth thinking about how many people you have to disagree with in order to adopt my friend's reading. So first of all, on the grammar, Judge Ho at page 56A of the petition appendix explains why it's perfectly natural to read function of the trigger to refer to what the shooter does to the trigger, not to what the trigger does by itself. 
Second, Justice Kavanaugh, you asked about contemporaneous usage. There's a lot of contemporaneous usage of people using the term pull of the trigger to be synonymous with function of the trigger. That makes perfect sense if we're talking about what the shooter does, because the way the shooter activates most, not all, but most triggers, is by pulling on them. But I think my friend conceded that usage is all inconsistent with his reading. And as you pointed out, there is no evidence that anyone at the time or ever since until the development of devices like these ever thought that function of a trigger meant mechanical movement independent of any action by the shooter. It's also worth emphasizing that even if you looked at what the trigger does by itself, what the trigger does is accept some input by the shooter. Justice Kagan, you asked about what about a voice activated trigger. You could also have a trigger that works by swiping a touch screen. Those triggers don't necessarily have any moving parts. On our understanding, we say, is there an act of the trigger that, uh, of the shooter that initiates the firing sequence, a spoken command, a swipe on the touch screen? It works perfectly. On my friend's understanding, I have no idea how he would deal with a firearm that did, had a trigger that did not have moving parts. We've also talked some about automatically, and I take my friend's point to be that he thinks because there's some continued manual input, the pushing forward, it can't be automatic. But automatic just means by way of a self-regulating mechanism. It doesn't mean it eliminates all manual input. It just means that it eliminates some of it. And contrary to what my friend said, a bump stock does eliminate manual action that the shooter has to take. With a semi-automatic weapon, you have to pull and release the trigger with each shot. With, an autom with a bump stock, the bump stock allows the recoil from each shot to automatically push the, the rifle back, disengaging the trigger, eliminating the need for the shooter to manually release, and then it channels the forward and backward movement in exactly the right way to allow a continuous firing cycle to continue. Now, I think it's also telling some of the gymnastics with respect that my friend has to do in order to deal with all of the other hypothetical and actual devices that have been out there. Because I think he recognizes that the Aikens Accelerator, the LV-15, the Electronic Reset Assist Device, the Fishing Reel in Camp, all of these workarounds have to be covered by the statute because it's just not plausible to think that Congress enacted something subject to such easy evasion. But the only way he can say that those are covered is by engaging in very implausible understandings of what the trigger is. I think for the Aikens accelerator, he suggested that maybe the trigger is the spring in the back of the rifle rather than the lever that the, the shooter actually pulls to start the firing sequence. On the black box hypothetical, I'm still not sure what his answer is, but I think it must be that the button is the trigger the first time it moves up and down, but then it stops being the trigger when it keeps moving up and down afterwards. I think those are all very implausible interpretations that this court should not give to a statute if there's another reading available, and our view is that there is another reading available. In short, we think Congress in 1934 wrote this statute not just for the kinds of devices that existed then, but for other kinds of devices that could be created in the future that would do the same thing. It enacted and strengthened these laws because it did not want members of the public or our nation's law enforcement officers to face the danger from weapons that let a shooter spray many bullets by making a single act. That's exactly what bump stocks do, as the Las Vegas shooting vividly illustrated. And we think this court should give the words Congress wrote their full natural meaning and hold that they encompass bump stocks. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted. I think it was well argued for both sides, and I'd be lying if I said not. And I think that, I think that the government's reading of it is not ridiculous. And the government's concerns about some of these bypass mechanisms are also quite reasonable. And trying to distinct and so if you want to say if you want to say that the non-mechanical bump stock is not a machine gun, but also want to say that some of these other devices are machine guns, then perhaps you do have a bit of a problem trying to define it that way. I suppose you could try to define it on the basis of the that there is the mechanic that it changes the nature of the trigger in some way because if you have a if you have an assist device by the nature of like a spring or a string or a whatever that that somehow because it interfaces with the trigger in some mechanical way that perhaps that's enough to consider changing the functionality of the trigger so even if you had a bump stock that had a spring in the bump stock, you could view the spring, which is a mechanical thing, as changing, albeit somewhat indirectly, the function of the trigger. 
now it's true that they're not necessarily connected to each other in in that strength sense but there's like but in a in a more of a uh ra they're not connected in perhaps a strict mechanical sense but they are connected in a causal sense that you have this additional mechanical apparatus that is interfacing with the trigger perhaps directly in the in the form of some of these gloves or other devices that pull the trigger or even indirectly in the in the face of a spring which is which is taking the recoil energy storing it and then using it to direct energy into the trigger it's a slightly it's a slightly uh, um, indirect way of thinking about it but it's not wholly ridiculous you know, it's not wholly ridiculous to think that that is changing the function of the trigger Whereas here, because this is non-mechanical, because this is this is something that doesn't do that and doesn't inter it doesn't change the trigger even in an indirect sense, that it's it's much harder to view it as changing the function or functionality of the trigger because the statute talks about the function of the trigger, and it's a little bit harder. So you could split it on that technical difference. Um. Although that does perhaps leave open additional avenues for non-mechanical ways of manipulating the trigger that might achieve the same functionality. And so the, the, the more left-leaning of the court is looking at this more in, the in terms of functionality in some sense. Well, it, it's, functionally, it's functionally equivalent to a full automatic or at least comparable to a full automatic. A full automatic prop is going to get more rounds than a bump stock, so a bump stock isn't going to work as fast as a full automatic, but it's certainly a lot closer um, than a uh, than you know not with a bump stock. So they're looking at more in terms of the functionality that one that one function, and they're looking also at the and they're also looking at the function of the trigger in a more abstract step in a more detached sense by looking at these ideas that talk about causality in a, in a more indirect sense, which isn't wholly invalid because you're just then trying to figure out like how deep off the chain of causation do you have to go before it, it's problematic. But this is, I don't think that's in that territory. So as long as you're like indirect, you're kind of okay. But so I think, I think that both sides actually make some pretty reasonable arguments um, to be fair. And the the both sides made really made really sound arguments. I don't think the questioning from the left side of the bench was as sharp as the government's argument. The government was the government was better on the left than the the bench was. So the if the bench you know the bench should probably just look at the government's brief harder and you know use that because the government had ideas that are much more workable than apparently their own ideas where they're very very confused about buttons and switches and all kinds of fun ways to make guns operate 800 rounds a second and so forth and so on so yeah but the government was sharper than the bench on the and and the, but the you know the guy on the the guy advocating for the uh for the bump stocks did well on his own he he has a perfectly reasonable argument that this is not modifying the function of the trigger and it doesn't have mechanical components and like so he does differentiate in a way that does make logical sense he does separate in a way that makes logical sense and he does point out i think fairly that the you know the atf for a long time said this isn't the case and of course members of congress also said it wasn't the case and obviously wasn't contemplated by it so then you're just trying to figure out what the straight words of the text mean and whether this is or is not contemplated so I think it's actually, it's a more interesting legal discussion than I gave credit for coming in. I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to think that I'm pretty pro Second Amendment and pretty pro gun, but of course I still have to, despite my own preferences, I still have to, to the best of my ability, interpret the law as best as I can. And I think there are, there are valid reasons. There are valid reasons to look at this 
from right-wing frameworks, although it's obviously easier in a left-wing framework, but there are ways to look at this in a right-wing framework that makes sense. And to do that, and I think the best thing really kind of going maybe at the end of the day is the rule of lenity might be the thing that might be the best, which they didn't spend any time in oral argument talking about the rule of lenity, although I'd be very surprised if it didn't come up in the briefing. But, you know, that's, there's, a, there's another way out of this problem, but a much more, much more interesting discussion than I gave credit for. I think it's going to be 5-4, though. I think it's going to be 5-4 kind of either way. And I don't really have, I wonder what the, predict, the predictors are currently saying. The predictors are not, you, they're not always great, but let's see what they say at least. Um, they, sometimes they're wildly wrong. But let's take a look at what the predictors are currently saying on this. Give me just a second to pull it up. Let's see. Uh, they are saying affirm 6-3. So they're thinking that they're going to agree with the court below. So they think, yeah, 6-3. I don't know. I think it's I think it's tenuous. They're predicting John Roberts sixty three percent. They're predicting Sonia Sotomayor a hundred percent chance to reverse. Elena Kagan a hundred percent chance to reverse. Kanji Brown Jackson ninety five percent chance to reverse. Probably the other way around, to be honest. I think Kagan's probably more likely to affirm than Jackson, but okay. Amy Coney Barrett, 68% chance to affirm. Kavanaugh, 63% chance to affirm. Roberts, 63% chance to affirm. It's tenuous, man. It's close. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on anything. We'll see. Does Vegas take bets? Not to the best of my knowledge, no, but that would be hilarious. I was looking at Fantasy Scottus. There's, there's Fantasy Football and there's Fantasy Scottus. I was looking at Fantasy Scottus to see what they were predicting. Oh, yeah. You can, do fan we, you can have Fantasy Scottus. We can have a team. We can, we can predict everything. Yeah, big time. So, good times. Have by all. So, we'll see, man. Yeah, that's Fantasy Scottus. It's FantasyScottus.net, I think. Scotus, if you prefer. Prop bets on like, the decisions and offers of that'd be good. Yeah, if we get some prop bets on that, that'd be funny. That'd be funny as shit. New addiction and coming, sure. Would a robotic prosthetic finger that could pull trigger the same way as an automatic weapon be considered a machine gun? Well, no, because the way the way the statute is defined again, it, at least, is to that much. It has to be a part that's designed and intended solely and exclusively for use in converting weapons. So if you actually had a bionic finger, presumably it's not designed and intended solely and exclusively. It's a, it's a bionic finger. So I know I don't think a bionic finger qualifies under the relevant definition. Yeah, there are a lot of thumbs up missing. And also a lot of people who haven't subscribed on Twitch in a while. So just a reminder, that's why we have the thing behind you in the first place to remind people. To, to remind them to, to subscribe on Twitch. I'm, I am. I feel good. I feel good today. I'm feeling good just generally. I'm in good spirits. Yeah, you do have to renew every month. That's the pain in the ass part, but yeah, you do have to renew every month. I'm glad the video isn't too, isn't too noisy. There's not enough noise. Yeah, I'm glad it's not. I'm glad it's not too noisy. It looks kind of noisy for me. The focus is also a little bit imprecise, but I see noise on my end. But I'm glad if it's okay for you, then it's okay for me.
Yeah, there is a little noise. Yeah, I could bring the ISO down. 64. That'll be a little less noisy at 64, but it makes my face so pale. It makes my face paler. And then I have to bump up the box to make myself less in the dark. Oh. Yeah, I have to bump up the light box a lot more, which harms my eyes. Yeah, the YouTube compression might kill the noise a little bit. That's cool. All right, cool. Well, for the moment, anyways, I'm going to sign off. This has been a lot of fun. I've been on Civil Law, and until later, my friends, I hope all of you have a great day for now. Is who's streaming? I haven't set up a restream. Who's streaming? Runkle on five? I'll send you Runkle's way. counter is fuzzy well that's probably a focus issue I could put it on a manual focus yeah it looks like the focus is a little bit in and out the fo yeah it shouldn't be it shouldn't be fuzzy because of the uh, ISO and it's just messing with the autofocus a little bit I have to put it on manual focus I guess. All right, I'm going to send you over to Ian. You know the drill. Be nice. Say hi. Try not to torture him. I'll talk to you later. I hope all is well. Bye-bye for now.